I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, with liberty and justice for all. This is the uh, Radnor Board of Commissioners meeting for Monday, March 14th. Uh, prior to this meeting, we held an executive session um, to discuss some legal matters. Uh, I am going to open up the floor to public participation on any uh, issue on the agenda or otherwise. There is also opportunity to speak when um, particular items are up for consideration. But I open the floor to the public for comment. Good evening. Peggy Hagan was kind enough to place those papers on your desk for me so I didn't have to take the time to pass them out. Um, my name is Kathy Wright. I live on Lenore Avenue and I am in Ward 1. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Radnor Township. We appreciate the opportunity to comment on the board's decision to redraw and approve the boundaries of the electoral districts in keeping with the Radnor Township Home Rule Charter which states in part, the township shall consist of seven electoral districts or wards, each of which shall nearly as possible be equal in population, be formed of compact and contiguous territory, and follow existing governmental, natural, geographic, and or major man-made boundaries and barriers with boundary lines running down the middle of streets. In 2014, the board appointed a subcommittee of three commissioners. It was two Democrats and one Republican at that time. They were assisted by Amanda Holt, an independent consultant. Finally, one map was accepted. Based on a review by the League of Women Voters in 2015, the League concluded that there was room for improvement in the process so that the next ward redistricting would be more independent and transparent. This in turn would facilitate more competitive elections. The League recommends that the board establish an oversight role within the working group or subcommittee by inviting one or more independent, nonpartisan organizations such as the League of Women Voters and or Common Cause to observe all of the meetings and that the minutes of the working group be made public in a timely manner. We also recommend that the, develop, the development of guidelines governing ward boundary changes that include an agreed upon approach to how to address the student dormitory populations. The League further believes that the boundaries should maintain the existing ward or precinct to the extent practical include minimal population variation between wards, maintain neighborhoods to the extent practical, and be fair and protective of diversity. We know that redistricting is a difficult process, and we commend the commissioners on their efforts to ensure that our local elections are fair, represent the will of all the people, and that the voters have meaningful choices. Do you all have any questions or comments? Thanks for listening. Good evening, Ken Kearns, um, Radnor resident, 221 Walnut Avenue in Wayne, and uh, 118 North owner. I'm here on behalf of the Music is Love Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit, which uh, produces and puts on the annual Wayne Music Festival. I know that before you tonight on the agenda is um, consideration of some of the funding necessary from the township level for police, public works, um, safety, life safety, some of the other things that we're um, kind of putting together to make sure this event is family friendly and safe. And uh, you know, this is a community event, but it's also a fundraiser. Um, in 2019, which was the last time we had the event, um, we raised more money than the event cost, and we were able to give $15,000 to a very specific initiative at Children's Hospital. So not only is this um, a great 
community gathering event and has become one of the largest events in the township. Um, but it's also a fundraiser for, a, for children's charities and um, it's also a great you know, example of how this township works together at the public works level, the police, fire, safety, and the commi board commissioners. So I'd like to ask that you consider um, appropriating those funds necessary for the, uh, to put the festival on again this year and uh, thank you for your consideration. Good evening, Heather Gill, Ivan Avenue. I'm here tonight to urge the board to put the residents of Radnor first and vote in favor of ordinance number 20022-03, prohibiting the sale or distribution of Kratom or Delta 8 at any location, dispensary or store within a thousand feet of a school, playground, daycare, uh, park, and as such outlined in the resolution. Passing of this ordinance is essential to protecting, preserving, and promoting the health, safety, and wellness of the citizens of Radnor. I have a list of people who are, some of, most of them are not able to be here tonight. Um, I can read off some of the names, but I don't want to tie you up, but it's a list of about 40 people. Fulton family, Finley family, Doyle, Hart, Fetter, Saunders, donors, uh, the Lures, Heisner, Engels, Lowry, it just goes on and on of people who couldn't attend tonight, so I don't want to waste your time reading all of them, but it's about 40 people. I just urge you, since this was something that was looked at about two years ago and was discussed and was tabled, to really put the residents first. We've done a lot of homework. We've had a town hall, the Board of Health. We've really done a lot of research and that we're coming to you to come together to compromise to put the residents first. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Matt Marshall, 228 Walnut Avenue, Wayne. Um, I know you're gonna hear a lot about uh, the ordinance to ban Kratom tonight, and that's not what I'm here to speak about, but I am here to remind the board and staff um, we, we've had zoning issues and um, particularly use issues going as far back as I can remember. I sat on the Planning Commission about 15 years ago and was part of the Wayne Business Overlay District. And what I'd like to suggest to the board, um, we're going to have continued uses that certainly are controversial to the residents and um, the safekeeping of the, the kids and children in Ratner. Um, I suggested this uh, probably around the time that the uh, Penn Medicine development was starting, and I don't think it's ever been uh, enacted or at least uh, has not been considered. I, I really believe at this point the board needs to consider hiring a third party consultant that's ex expert in land use and zoning and uses because I think what's happening uh, to the retail corridor in Wayne is pretty self-evident. We have a lot of vacancy. We have a lot of uses that don't really mix. Uh, there is a lot of uh, development opportunity. As we know, uh, some of the recent um, proposals, including the apartments at uh, Wayne Presbyterian Church are positives, but uh, we have a lot of um, risk if, if the ordinances go as they are currently written. And I would implore to the board, please interview two or three land use and um, development advisors uh, to consult with the board. Because if you don't, you're just gonna continue to run into these issues. Um, and I think you're gonna hear from a bunch of people tonight about how they feel about Kratom, but it could be anything. So uh, hopefully you'll You'll take that seriously and consider that. Thank you. Hi, Clark Engel, Wayne PA. Um, I wasn't planning on coming or speaking tonight because I have a prior commitment. I have to be somewhere at 730, but um, I didn't know that this ordinance about the regulation of Kratom was uh, on the agenda. I found out, found out kind of late, so I didn't have any sort of prepared comments, but as a father of four, I'm very concerned about this store opening, and if you've 
uh, done any research on any of the stores that sell this product already. There's, uh, there's no labeling, there's no dosage requirements because it's not regulated. And if you look at the way it's sold in packages, love imitation Oreo cookies, uh, Rice Krispies, Lucky Charms, it's obviously targeted to kids. Um, and where it's located, they're, they're marketing to kids. Um, so I, I implore you to please pass this ordinance regulating Kratom tonight. Thank you. So I'm glad to come, come on the heels of, of that comment. My name is Karen Korfman. I'm a registered nurse, BSN. And uh, I work daily with people dealing with substance abuse. I'm wondering how many of you here today have watched the miniseries Dope Sick. It was brought up at the town hall meeting a week ago. And it was a little cue to me. Uh, about the importance of the history of the opioid epidemic and where we are today with regard to the opioid epidemic, as well as where we are today with a new drug that's coming in that can be a vehicle into our youth as well as anyone. So if you have seen this series, and if you just take one minute, you can easily see some important unmistakable unmistakable similarities to the current Kratom issue that we're dealing with here in the township as well as across the country. Let me give you a quick overview. Dope Sick is the story of how America got hooked on a lie by a family and a pharmaceutical company, the marketers. Dope Sick documents the crimes of callous members of the Sackler family who owned Purdue Pharma and who engineered an amazing scam on Americans so they could become richer and richer. They did this by targeting vulnerable individuals, people in various stages of chronic physical and emotional pain during a time when we did not have appropriate or adequate research on the drug Oxycontin. We additionally were offered erroneous facts about the drug it helps you. You can't get addicted. Your pain will be managed and you're going to feel better. And your pain's going to be managed safely. So lies, lack of education, lack of proper research, as well as training, is the reason where, that we are where we are with the current opioid crisis that today I want to remind you kills over 100,000 lives, over 100,000 lives annually from overdoses. This number is up 30%, 30% from pre-pandemic numbers. And at that time, I stood in front of Congress requesting federal funds for education, training, and expanding research relating to opioids and opioid use disorder because no one listened early on, back in the 90s and the early 2000s, and instead they listened, listened to and trusted the lies that they were being fed across all forms of media, innocent people with chronic physical and mental pain got hooked. And here we are today, 2022, with people overdosing and dying, but they're not only dying from opioids. Let me change that. They're not only dying because they are addicted to opioids. They're dying, kids are dying today because they're out just getting high. The lesser drug, the one that's not so potent. But what people aren't understanding is that those lesser drugs are actually the vehicle through which the killer fentanyl drug is using, is being used to get into the body. So I'm wondering if any of you are seeing my, my point. Let me be more specific. Today we have marketers telling us that Kratom and Delta-8 are safe. Turns out that Kratom acts on the same opioid receptors in the brain that opioids do. The mu opioid receptor. It holds the quality and molecular makeup of two opioids, codeine and buprenorphine. Those two make up a rather strong and deadly combo, which explains why when I'm working with these people and trying to help them detox, 
they're taking two weeks longer than someone just coming off of heroin. Kratom contains not one, but two, two active psychoactive compounds then, and it comes from Southeast Asia, Thailand being one place, and today, Thailand has banned the drug because after decades of, of use and seeing extraordinary adverse effects, it's now a Schedule I narcotic. That's where it comes from. People have died here and everywhere, and autopsy has revealed that they had kratom in their body upon death. Have any of you seen the kratom packaging, as was just mentioned? It directly targets school-aged children who at the very least have wonderful and fond memories of eating Lucky Charms and Snickers etched in their memory stores. It looks just like this, exactly. I didn't go out and get the bag, but it's really just like this. There it is. Thank you. So these masterful marketers are just like the Sinklers who had utter and complete disregard for patients who became addicted or for the communities devastated by the disease. These marketers indeed lack care for the lives of, of people who are dying. They just want their money. At a town hall meeting last week, a person dealing with substance use disorder stood up rather honorably to remark on the effectiveness of Kratom. I With regard to his detoxing, wrap up your it, is, it is done. Uh, it's as good as Lucky Charms. I can't be more excited if we have something new that comes on the market that can help people in terms of get, getting pain relief from substance use or any other pain disorders. But if Kratom even has caused harm to a few kids, and if even one person has died with it in their system, and we're risking even more injury, then we have a duty to do the labor-intensive work of research, and we have to carry that out. It's our duty to us and to our children, to Thank our you. animals as well. They get into the things that come home, things like these. Time's Thank up. you so much. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is um, Brian Johnson. Before you start, Brian, I'd just like to remind everybody it's a five-minute limit. Yeah, for, no problem. For, uh, so um, uh, I'm at 227 Radnor Street Road. Uh, now, I guess I'm starting to call myself a longtime resident of Wayne. <laughs> but um, I actually want to just to par parlay on some of these stories that we just talked about. I think the passion of the previous uh, presenter was excellent. I think I wanted to talk about what I just found out today is now called Ordinance 2022-03 about Kratom. I, um, I'm actually an assistant scoutmaster for the Boy Scouts. And one of my responsibilities when I go camping with Boy Scouts is to watch after all the boys. And uh, one of the things that we do is we have something called Town Day. Does anybody sound, does that sound familiar to anybody? Maybe Rock Twain Day? Does that sound a little familiar? And it's exactly the same. They get a chance to experience a town when we're camping. They have a little bit of free time. And lo and behold, they're out of town. And the first thing they find is a CBD shop and go buy a bunch of CBD jellies and thinks it's funny. That's the reality. The kids believe that it's funny. They don't understand what the, the drug is. And you will find people buying things immediately. So what do we do? I had to go and take away from everyone and give a very stern lecture about what the impact of these drugs could be. But I just want to share that it's very real what the previous person said about the advertising. It's very real about the impacts of what these drugs could be. And I would urge you, as my request is, I see 1,000 feet here, 1,000 feet. I don't know if this is working. 1,000 feet. Gee whiz, <laughs> that's not very far. It should be 2,000 feet. But if that prevents us from approving anything tonight or whenever it is, because I don't know what the schedule is, I would highly recommend you approve ordinance 20 22-03, and furthermore, in the next meeting or the meeting after that, you amend it to go to 5,000 feet because that's probably more appropriate to uh, how far kids can walk from a school. Um, otherwise, I would say I'm looking forward to other comments from people in the audience about this particular ordinance, and thank you very much for your support and trying to do the right thing for the residents of Wayne. Thank you.
Good evening, Commissioners. Mike Lake, 4th Ward. After hearing the unanimous calls for an outright ban on the retail sales of Kratom, Delta 8, THC, and its derivatives from my neighbors, the proposal for a mere 1,000-foot bubble around school properties would, see, would leave some to believe that you, in fact, represent the interests of the Kratom Company. Radnor is the hometown of my children who don't just live and play in a 1,000-foot circle surrounding the schools. Don't worry what other towns are allowing or what might be on a UPS truck. Don't worry about potential future legislation when you won't even recognize current federal pre preemptions. Please remain focused on the issue and your powers at hand. If you want to take care of the issue quickly and efficiently, pretend this is a budget meeting and simply add an extra zero to the 1,000 foot radius. Problem solved. Thank you. Is there any other comment? Hi, hi, good evening. Hi, I'm Kate Hart. I live on Meadowbrook Circle in Ward 3. I don't really have much to add tonight. I was here about a month ago and I had a letter signed by 90 families and residents. I think you remember that was when I first was introducing the concept of how deadly Kratom is. But I did just want to add that there is a um, petition over the past month that's gotten 1,000 signatures by residents asking for this substance to be banned. And I have to say, over the past month, I think this issue has actually brought our community a lot closer. It's something that people on both sides of the political spectrum are working together on. And I think that this is really an opportunity for all of you to be leaders and to pass, be the first in the state to pass something that would protect our children protect our community, our health, our safety, and our welfare. And I really urge you tonight to pass this, and I, I, I agree with Michael, <laughs> maybe we add two more zeros, but um, at least to pass it at 1,000 feet would be the best thing for our kids, but I'd love to ban it completely from Radnor. But please um, listen to the 1,000 people that signed the petition and take this into consideration. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Yes, my name's Doug Blazy at 215 Upland Way, so fairly nearby. Uh, you've obviously, there's a lot of discontent with this product in this location, but I had a slightly different thought I wanted to share with you because I thought it long before I ever knew there was going to be a marijuana or a drug outlet there that the traffic and the circulation at that property is awful. When it was a Starbucks to go in, it was one way to get to the beer yard or any of those properties was a nightmare and coming out's a nightmare. So I just would urge the township to ask, what do we think the traffic flow would be at this facility? Is it, do you believe it to be less than when there was a Starbucks? If it's more, I think that's a, a real drawback because this facility can't handle it. It's a one-way loop. You're running into steel pillars. There will be children and others walking on the sidewalk, so I think there's a real risk if we think there's going to be increased traffic as well, as well as to the product they're selling. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mike Robinson. I'm from 5... 65 West Wayne Avenue. Um, I didn't want to miss my chance here. I'm not sure if this is going to be talked about later, but Ordinance 2022-04, uh, which relates to certain parts of the zoning code that have to do with um, minimum parking spaces and setbacks. Uh, I was speaking with the uh, township building today, and apparently there are a number of projects that are running afoul of the zoning um, this part of the zoning code which requires that you have two parking spots at a residential property and that they're 80 feet off of the right of way. Um, my property is almost an acre and 80 feet is still an unrealistic amount of space to, uh, to make it off the street to have parking spots. In fact, my existing garage is within 80 feet of the right of way. I have a U-shaped driveway that can fit five or six cars and I can't park them there according to the zoning code. Uh, you know, I have to maintain two spots that are further away than that. Uh, the current um, proposed ordinance that would 
you know, amend the zoning code to say that these setback requirements do not apply to residential properties. I think that's a good start. Honestly, I think the entire zoning code could be a little more permissive so people can do what they want with their property. But with regards to this issue, it does seem that that would, um, that would solve the problem for many of the people who are at, currently have applications for permits and buildings and that sort of thing. Uh, so I would encourage the, uh, the board to, to pass that ordinance and, and amend the zoning code. So thank you. Hi, Brian Kiefer. I, I live at 124 Calvary's Lane. I want to piggyback on that comment. Um, I'm also here to talk about 202204 about the uh, setbacks um, for uh, single and, and two family residences. Uh, I also found out about that recently where I heard, uh, in addition to my home, uh, a few other homes also have had um, some rejected uh, proposals for renovation work. Um, I was hoping to uh, do some work uh, and uh, the parking garage that I have in my, you know, very compact garage doesn't even get you, it gets used for storage, not for parking. And so we thought with, you know, COVID and, and you know, a lot of remote work possibilities that we could expand our, our home and, and my family of my wife and I and our, my, my three-year-old and our one-year-old, we could really take full advantage of our home here in Radnor because we don't feel like we could expand within this community. We want to stay in this, we really want to raise our daughters in this, in this uh, you know, school district and this community. So it's a great opportunity, I think, if it can be, uh, if the amendment can be, um, you know, accepted, to allow us to grow in the community by, um, you know, having the parking in our driveway, a very long driveway, count, you know, as parking, real parking, because it is. That's where we park a car. Our, our, our vehicles never end up on the street, which I think was the original intent of the um, ordinance. So um, we're, we're looking to, you know, um, provide betterment to. Our, our property and the community as a whole. Um, and uh, right now we're being restricted from doing that. So we really uh, hope that you would consider that motion and um, you know, that uh, we look forward to hearing the result. And uh, thank you for, you know, thank you for hearing. Is there any other public comment? Not seeing any, I will. Uh, move on to the consent agenda. Is there any public comment on an item um, that is on the consent agenda? Not seeing any. Is there any item that a commissioner would like to pull from the consent agenda? Not hearing any. Um, I will ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. And a second? Second. I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, and moving on to the um, section three of the agenda, item A, a motion to improve the July 11th, 2022 Wayne Music Festival. The motion also requests approval for the road closure, safety, and staffing resources for the music festival. Sorry, a point of order, uh, Commissioner Roney. Sorry, we got a lot of people in here. Could we just move D up? I don't know if that, the people here, your feelings on that? Um, I, do, I don't think the items between now and D are going to be okay. onerous. It's only seven o'clock. If it were later in the meeting, got I would it. entertain okay. it. Thanks. Thank you for asking. Um, so for the the item A is just read. I'm going to ask Chief Flanagan uh, to walk us into this topic. Yeah, well, uh, the chief gets situated. I'll, I'll tee it off uh, and be brief. Uh, included in the board packet was a summary of the plan um, that was developed by Chief Flanagan along with um, Mr. Foster, Mr. Kachansky, uh, and coming up with a comprehensive safety plan for an event that um, I think was last held in 2019. Uh, where uh, an estimated 10,000 people uh, came to Wayne and listened to music all day long and, uh, as far as we know, had a fantastic time. Um, what we're, <clears throat> our, our approach in putting this plan together was to come up with a safety and uh, service plan that um, recognized the, the success of the event uh, and the possible crowd sizes and at the same time um, offered a level of, of, 
of safety that uh, an event like that with that size crowd uh, would mandate. <clears throat> and if, if you picture Wayne uh, and all the different areas of ingress and egress, both uh, pedestrian and traffic, uh, there's a lot of posts uh, which require a lot of personnel to, sta to staff. Um, and so the plan calls out uh, what we think is necessary both in, ter or in terms of police uh, for the setup and the breakdown, but then also obviously the event itself as well as public works for um, sanitation and, and cleanliness of the area and then for codes both the uh, the pre setup and then um, at the end if there's proposed fireworks and in, in, in making sure that those go off safely so uh, the plan has put forth um, uh, one other important element to that of, with regard to police is that we wanted to ensure that there was no interruption to the rest of the township uh, as a result of this event going on. So almost all of the costs are on some sort of overtime. Um, but that was to ensure that the, the regular patrols by the platoons are, are uninterrupted. Um, so the rest of the township is covered uh, as it would be normally. Uh, with that plan, it does uh, carry a cost with it. Uh, we estimate it to be just around 42,000 uh, for the township. That includes all of the payroll costs as well as the costs associated with um, uh, making sure that there's an ambulance on standby ready to go, uh, as well as renting various uh, crowd control devices, uh, barricades, fencing, uh, those types of things. Um, so that would be the total cost for the township. Uh, and that's, what, um, that's what's in front of you tonight, along with obviously the need to close North Wayne Avenue and West Wayne Avenue. So uh, if there are more detailed questions, uh, the chief uh, or I are happy to answer them. There are questions from Board of Commissioners. No question. I do have a question. Um, uh, Bill, or perhaps Bob, can you speak to um, the cost that we allocated in 2019, the last time this festival was held? Yeah, I don't know if we have the exact numbers, but what we what we can tell you is that in 2019, uh, we had, in terms of a safety plan, had set up for an event that was similar to in size to the Jazz Fest um, community events that had happened in years prior, um, and as a result, um, were well understaffed versus the crowd that showed up. Um, so, I, had we gone into 2019 understanding the scope of the event, I'm sure we would have had a larger response. Um, so those numbers don't don't compare to what we're presenting tonight, um, but that was mostly out of um, not being or not having a full understanding of the size and scope of the, the crowd that was going to attend. So, um, Chief, can I just ask? So, when you are considering this, and and I was at the 2019 event, I know it was really successful, and uh, but certainly a, a lot of people. What are the things that you considered as you put this plan together? So, I know it's not just uh, you know crossing, you know, getting people across the street. There's a whole lot of other considerations, and you guys really modeled this. Is this you modeled this off of the crowds that we expected in that we had in 2019? Correct, expecting something similar and I know that Mr. Kearns is here is this are we expecting a similar you're 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 going to expect a similar amount of crowd uh, people to attend this yes ma'am just just two points for the board uh, before I answer that uh, we also have to once the if you approve this event we will also go and, and um, obtain a state road closure permit so we do have to do that as part of anything when we shut down a state roadway so and I would like to note that um, Mr. Kearns did attend with the president of the Wayne Business Association and had the Wayne Business Association's endorsement uh, of the event as well and their support to the specific event. Um, event planning, as everyone is aware, has become a very serious topic. Um, it's as much on the mind as school safety. Um, some of the large scale events have had some problems. We don't anticipate any of those, but we also have cra crafted an all hazard approach as Mr. White gave in detail, police, fire, EMS, public works, and including the event team, that they're a part of our management uh, of that incident so that we can safely uh, mitigate any things. One of the biggest things is uh, safety of the residents who are coming to visit the great event, making sure that they can cross. And we always have officers at different posts. And uh, 
it is a very thorough event planning uh, detail, and we spent a lot of time on it. And I forgot to mention the codes department is along with us as well. So you have a full cache of our best people there in case anything comes up from a broken water heater to a problem with a generator, uh, a trash truck, a backhoe, or police, uh, an EMS and fire. It's all ready to go in case we do need to pull on it, even for a simple thing. So, or a lost child, those type of things we prepare in great detail to handle. And we do expect a crowd. I mean, it's, it's best guess, but we do expect to have a decent turnout. It's been two years since people have been able to get out. We're, we're actually expecting a lot of people for St. Patrick's Day. It's gonna, you know, so a lot of weather and other things. So I think we'll see a little bit of an increase. It was a very, very well done event. And, and I think we're gonna see an increase because of the hard work uh, uh, that they do producing a great show. Are there any other um, comments from commissioners? So, so just, just so I understand the process, we're having comments, and then are we voting after the comments? <clears throat> oh, so this is our, th this is our, this. Well, I, I just wanted to know the process. So I, I mean, I do have comments. I don't have questions for the chief, but I, I will have comments. So do I have a motion uh, to approve this this vote? Do I have a second? Second. Okay. I'm going to um, ask if there are any comments from commissioners. Is this a step? No, no, no. I, I have comments. Um, does any, anyone else? This is okay. Um, so we are voting on this tonight. We are voting on approving the plan tonight. Okay. About I don't, okay. Um, so, um, and, and the plan is in the packet. The plan is in the packet and as described by the chief, okay. which is, um, comes with a, I think what we're struggling with, I'll just speak a little bit to this. We're struggling with the price tag. Thanks. Um, I, thank you. And thank you. I we think we were, already. we are hoping to have yeah. continued conversations with the planners of this event around the cost and who is shouldering the cost. Tonight we are voting on whether or not we approve the plan, but um, so my my concern is if we approve a plan, we're saying that we're going to do it, and well, I may like the plan. Well, Sean, it says it says in the motion. It says the motion also requests approval for the road closure safety and staffing resources. So is it one vote or two votes? It says one vote. So if you vote, so if you take one vote and you vote in the affirmative, you're voting for not only you're voting for the. Okay. To, so prove the event and the plan. Okay, so I'd like to just make a point of order. Pardon, Commissioner Maroney. Could this be just a general, and, and I don't know if this is uh, kosher with the solicitor, could this be a general um, conversation? Maybe we can bring some of the people from the pub public. We have a lot of people here. And then kind of digest this and then maybe vote next week. Almost like this is an introduction. And I mean, you we can sleep on it and evaluate it and hear back from our constituents because you you can you can do that Sean or you can vote on it tonight I mean I know the, the cost is an issue you can approve the plan subject to the costs as, with the condition subject to the costs being finalized with the township manager I move so, to amend subject to what you just said John so Second. all right well there's, I'm not, there's I'm been not no before motion. you make no motion, motion I'd like to so get the answer and then motion. finish my comments if I could please thank you um, Wait, before you do, Jack, can you withdraw your motion so he can continue his comment? Thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner. Okay, thanks. So if we do have issues about backfilling or um, you know, where this money is or looking for uh, more, um, th that's something that we can, we can do. I mean, I I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation I am. I don't want to vote tonight. I am not comfortable voting tonight. Uh, my vote tonight would probably be no. So I'm happy to have the conversation, and to um, maybe vote next week. That's that's where I stand here. But I'm um, one vote. So same motion. What is your motion, Jack? To approve the plan and discuss costs at a later date. Do I have a second? Second. 
call the vote on the motion as I'm hearing it. The motion is to amend item 3A to approve the plan of the June 11th, 2022 Wayne Music Festival and delete the motion also requests approval for the road closure safety and staffing resources for the music festival. So we'd agree that this is the overtime that we need to let the police budget for. We just would not today say that the township will be the one that pays for it. I want people to be able to look at their calendars in advance. Okay, so I've got a motion and a second. We'll vote on that. It's voting for the plan, but not um, approving the, the resources to come fully so from the this, township. We're, we're voting on an amendment, not on the Just, whole package. We're voting to see if we would like to, we are voting on the amendment. Just on the amendment. Yes. Okay. Then the amendment would be to then vote just for approval of the event itself and not an approval of the resources yet. Okay. I'm going to call the it. vote on the amendment. All yep. in favor vote. say aye. 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 Nay. I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't think, and I'm so, oh, yeah, sorry, and I'll just want to respond and then we can have the other vote. Uh, I don't, do we know these bands? Do we know how big this is going to be? So for us to forecast, is it 40,000 or could it be 80,000? I just think that um, uh, we're putting the cart before the horse here. So, uh, Chief, I trust everything that you would do. I just, I don't have enough information on the size and scope of this thing, who are the headliners going to be, how many stages and everything. And I know it's in the plan, but it's just a, a lot that, a lot of variables. Thanks. So the amendment passed. Uh, we are still considering a vote on whether or not to approve the event itself uh, only with no discussion of resources. I would then invite uh, Mr. Kearns to join us at our next meeting and give a larger presentation of the plans for the event alongside um, the chief of police. Does that work for everyone? I'm trying to feel my way into this. Okay. You're making it, the decisions move to next meeting? Well, we're gonna vote whether or not the festival is going off tonight. Uh, well, I, I that's can't. How, that's I, I what can't. the amendment was. I, that's the amendment. I, I, I mean, to so it could go off, but festival. then we don't fund the police, which means that we don't have it. I, I, this is a little convoluted for me. No, I'm sorry, John, you basically said we could approve the plan, approve the plan, the event, and then discuss Br later. Bring the cost back. Bring the cost back. Right. So that is what the amendment was, and that right. is what we're doing. And I think that personally that amendment and approving the plan for the event also gives the um, organizers some uh, gravitas as they're out there working with potential sponsors and additional people to bring more money to the table. Mr. Kearns, yes, no? <laughs> but at least we've got a step, so. Um, so the vote tonight's not approving the funding of this. It's yeah. just approving the overall plan that, that the chief and emergency management has prepared with the road, you know, not any permits, not any resources, not any costs. That'll come back in, I guess, two weeks with the presentation. Okay. That, that, what I, that's what I heard the motion was. Okay, so if, there's, if we don't approve the money for the police, then this wouldn't happen? Right. Or it could, okay. In two well, weeks. Well, right. or, well, no, that's or not. Or the organizers will Yeah, or the organizers. I'm sorry, pardon me. It you're, doesn't you're mean correct. that Or the organizers, or if there's not a, another plan in the works that we can agree on. Okay, fair enough. Okay, are there any other comments from commissioners on the amended, the amended um, vote, which is just to approve the plan for the Wayne Music Festival as presented by the chief with discussions for um, how much it will cost and where that cost will come from to happen at a later date. Any other, any other comments from commissioners? I would like to hear from the public. Anybody want to speak on this issue? Jake, did you want to say something? No, I, I'm really interested <laughs> in what you're going to say. 
Well, I, listen, I think this is uh, Matt Marshall, 228 Walnut Avenue. I have, um, you know, no um, connection to the organizer, to the sponsors, but I think it's endemic upon the board to realize what you just did. You have a volunteer who's brought 10,000 people into Wayne, and that was t two years ago. And since then, through the Wayne Business Association, you had tent and live music in Jack Larkin's ward, where you've had Wall Street Journal giving this town international praise for bringing live musical acts to Wayne. He's got 86 days to organize this event. And now you're saying, no, we're going to let them know in like 15 days from now. So that's 71 days for a $40,000 expenditure that, I don't know, I think that would probably be difficult for anyone on the board to try to conceptualize. But this is exactly what I'm talking about. The Wayne, the Wayne downtown is changing. And if we know there's a recipe that works, like a music festival, why not support it? We have dying retail up and down Lancaster Avenue, dying retail. And then we have a Kratom store that nobody wants. I think the board needs to step back and think about this. This is going to be reactionary every time a new proposal comes to you. So why not think about this as a benefit, possibly an attraction to have in the community that people clearly like? So those are my thoughts. Thank you. belabor this, but um, I do want you to also recognize, so Matt's right, um, not only have you been recognized by other communities and newspapers and magazines and things for a lot of volunteer work that was a lot of hours and a lot of, believe me, no one's getting paid for this stuff. Um, and um, we were recognized by Lower Marion Township, and Lower Marion Township now has us running their organizations at the Bryn Mawr Gazebo Concert Series, as well as um, an event in Suburban Square. We've also been recognized by Upper Marion Township, and we're now running the Upper Marion Concerts Under the Stars, and we're also doing the concert series at the Exton Eagle View uh, community. So, and by the way, those organizations, those townships commit dollars to this. I came to you um, I don't know, a couple months, whatever, six months ago, asking for um, you know, this being allocated in the township budget. We, we got to start thinking that way. It's really, it's really productive for not only just the businesses in the community, but the community as a whole um, to have you know, events like this that we do, you know, we, I know we do the 4th of July parade and all these things. I want this thing to be considered um, in line with those when we start talking about budgets every year because we've proven, we've proven that it works. It's a charitable organization. It makes us look like we're all working together, which we are, and other townships have recognized the value that we're bringing and have asked us to do the same for them. So I, it's kind of, you know, hard for me to, for all the time I spent on this thing, and this is our sixth one, um, have to have to kind of keep coming back to the well of my own township when other townships are asking me to do this like it's just to me it's a little bit frustrating so understand i appreciate the comment matt and um you know we'll, we'll talk in the next couple weeks uh good evening jason mangler uh 425 ivan in the third ward while not the purpose of my being here tonight, happy to impart what I've uh, been able to share or share what I've been able to uh, gain as uh, experience. Uh, from 2015 to 2018, I ran a bike race in Ambler, Pennsylvania. Uh, my team and I, a bunch of volunteers, put it on, went to the board, asked for them to close the streets down throughout all of downtown Ambler, and we ran a bike race which 3,000, maybe 4,000 people tops. 10,000 people, more than 10,000 people, that's amazing, that's tremendous. We did this in August when Ambler had no one in town. They were happy to have the event, but this event with just bike racers and a bunch of cyclists coming was around fifteen to $20,000 with police, payouts, et cetera. <clears throat> we went and asked the board for that approval no less than six months beforehand so that we could go door to door asking vendors, asking retailers asking businesses in Ambler and others to support that project. So we didn't ask for any money from, uh, from the township, or I should say from the taxpayers, but we would have loved to. We would have loved to have that opportunity. And I know the town was sad to see the race end, and I think it's a, a really great use of our taxpayer money to put this kind of event on and bring people to town when they wouldn't normally be here.
Are there any other comments? I'm going to call the vote on the um, as amended to Wait. approve. Can I just ask one question? Yeah. I mean, can we be assured that the conversations can happen and this will come back to us at our next meeting? Okay. And then, so, and then we'll have the conversation then and the commissioners who have concerns and questions about the expense can ask those questions at that time? Okay. Yes, full conversation about the finances at the next meeting. Uh, I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Um, okay. Ken, I'll be reaching out to you. Thank you. Moving on to item B, resolution 2022-08, approval of Concordia, Eagle and Radnor Road, 18 lot subdivision, sewage, sewage facilities planning module. Mr. Norsini, can you tell us about this? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. So this is rather perfunctory in nature. Uh, you may recall that the, the commissioners may recall that this 18 lot subdivision did receive final approval from the Board of Commission Commissioners. Uh, they needed some outside agency approvals, this being the one for sanitary sewer capacity. So what you have before tonight is what we've had many times. It's the planning module that goes to DEP for them to be able to obtain sewage capacity for the development. It's been reviewed by staff and our consultant and we also request that this be uh, approved by the board. Any questions from commissioners? Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. A second. second. Um, any public comment? I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next item is uh, 236 North Aberdeen Avenue. This is just a caucus um, for land development. Mr. So, Norsini, can you uh, open? Madam it? President, so you have Christy Flynn here along with her engineer, as you noted, for caucus for this two lot subdivision. Uh, no requirement is or request is made for an approval tonight. It's just informational for the board. Good evening, I'm Christy Flynn. Thank you for having me tonight. I'll keep it sh as short as I can given the other things on the agenda tonight. If I am um, skipping something for you though, please don't hesitate to uh, stop me. I'm here tonight for the minor subdivision of the property at 236 North Aberdeen. So if you can picture the block of North Aberdeen, that is the one-way section that runs from Radnor Street Road towards the intersection with Plant, so on the north side of the railroad. Um, and it's one way with parking on the north side. This uh, property is on the north side of that road, fairly close to the stop sign as you come towards Plant. I'm gonna start with this one. So. Uh, the existing property is um, a single family property. It's on a double lot. The block is primarily uh, made up of twin homes uh, with a sprinkle of single family homes and some multifamily as well. Uh, the, existing, the existing house is on the west side uh, of the property here and then there's an existing driveway that goes down to the, the rear yard for the parking pad. The street is higher, the rear yard is lower, so it slopes down from street to the rear there. The proposal that we have before you, if you would, Chris, is to remove the existing house and to build a pair of twins, so go from one residential unit to two residential units. We are proposing two car garages for each of them to satisfy the parking requirements. We do have infiltration uh, systems for each of them. So the current property has no stormwater management facilities uh, for the how any of the impervious, but we would be proposing to manage all of the stormwater that the new uh, impervious created would generate. Um, we have clean review letters from uh, both Gannett Fleming 
uh, and Gilmore, and your planning commission recommended approval at their February meeting. Um, and so we would seek to um, be before you at your next meeting for approval with that. We are requesting two waivers. They're outlined on the Gilmar, Gilmore letter if you'd like to follow along. The first is uh, from the section of your subdivision code that requires um, the showing of all of the significant features within 500 feet of the property. We've provided an aerial in place of that survey data. And then the second is requesting the um, waiver of the requirement to have driveways greater than five feet from the side property line. The reason that we've asked for that is because we've, we've put the driveways on the shared property line of these new homes rather than allow them to be close to the existing uh, neighbor property lines. So we've put the driveways here and so they would be closer than five feet to each other but not to the property lines with the existing neighbors on either side. <coughs> Happy to answer questions. Any questions from commissioners? Is this in a, uh, no, 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 no. Um, it looks like you took out this huge driveway and the house and then are replacing with this twin. Um, what's the change in the impervious? Chris, do you have that, that statistic? Is it up, down? Sounds like it might be up a little bit. Yeah, the existing impervious is around 18%, um, and the proposal will be about 35%. So it is an increase, but it's, it's managed, where right now there is no management of the stormwater at all. It runs down, the, there's a creek that runs along behind the, the property. And in the new proposal, we would manage that impervious. Thanks. Is it in a floodplain? It is not. The floodplain is delineated um, here. How far, uh, how many feet away is it from the floodplain? So the dark dotted line that you see here is the floodplain. Um, there's a fair bit of slope from the rear of the property to the front. So the floodplain is at probably the contour line of like 359 and the mm -hmm. finished floor of this is at 380. So it's, it's much above the floodplain. Okay, how far is the actual structure, the end of the impervious Dude. to that creek or where the slope really starts to drop? We'll scale it for you. Okay. And does it ground perk now or? It yes, we have, we have perk tests and we've provided those to your professional, your engineers reviewed them. Okay. Lot two really has any impervious closest to the uh, stream, and so that proposed rear deck and patio to the floodplain line uh, is about 57 feet, and it would be even further to the creek itself. Okay. Have you contacted the neighbors via um, letters, uh, snail mail about this? We and sure have. Their, and their responses? I mean, I don't, is anyone from the audience here? because of this Aberdeen? Okay, that's usually a good sign, but okay. We, we've been kicking this project around for a few years now, okay. um, and we've, we've done door knocks. We have had planning commissions. We did go to the zoning hearing board um, because of existing steep slopes, so they received notice for the zoning hearing board, um, as well as for the planning commission meeting, we sent the, the registered letters to all of the neighbors. Okay. Any other questions for Ms. Flynn? Yeah, so a question for Steve or, or Jack as the representative of, of the ward. You know, when we've got a few areas in the township that we're really focused on during major storms and flooding. Is this an area that is prone to flooding? So this is not a spot that floods. Um, you're not too far away from spots that flood, but my recollection is that the stormwater management facilities that were being put in on this site were a substantial upgrade from what was there previous. 
So there's already a good deal of improvement that's baked into the project. And would, would you, again, for Jack or, or for Steve, if, you were to, if this project were to go forward and you've taken this one house down, you've now increased the impervious on the property from 18% to 36%, what, what impact would you be having on neighbors um, downstream? So, Commissioner, uh, Ms. Flynn stated it correctly. So you have an existing house at 18% impervious with zero stormwater management. So every drop of rain that hits the driveway, the roof, just runs down to the creek. Uh, the requirements of our stormwater management, they are going to have to manage all the impervious surface, albeit increased. It will now be managed. It will be controlled. So that's actually a better situation than what you have now. When I read this, though, I actually see the total impervious proposed is 3054 square feet, which you have after it is 34.8. And then when I look at the existing impervious, I see 3195, which is actually a larger number. Well, because what we're calculating that, that ratio on would be the two new lots. So currently there's, there's an existing impervious coverage of 3,195 square feet. Lot one would have 3,054 square feet, and lot two, a little lower down, would have 3,162. So uh -huh. it is an increase in impervious, but it is also managed. I see. Thank you very much. Of course. You don't anticipate needing a waiver for stormwater, do you? No. I'm mean, looking at the... <laughs> okay, I'm just looking at it. So it says... You've got the infiltration report, the stormwater, but final approval of the plan will be required as part of the grading permit. So, so you have a multi-step process mm -hmm. as part of this subdivision and land development. When this is recorded and then the building is about to proceed, there will be a grading permit with the individual specifics of exactly the size of the system and the details of how that likely pipe and stone will work and that's part of the grading application, not the subdivision application. But we have provided, we've done testing, and we have provided the data that shows that the, imper the pervious, the infiltration will work to, co to deal with the impervious surface. And just for my own, so describe to me exactly where this is again. Is this near the, you have the other development that's going in, correct? Yeah, so you can see the, um, American Pool Store yeah. from mm -hmm. this property. Okay. Yes. So this is this is not a Rockwell project. This is a Christie Flynn project. Ah. Oh, okay. um, a little bit nuance in the detail, but um, yes, Rockwell is building very close by to this. So this is close by. Since you raised that, is this? Um, are you planning to reside in this? Or I, I saw that you were the applicant, not Rockwell. So That's, is this, a, this a is your personal development? Or are you planning to use it as a resident? Well, it's, it's tough to say right now. Um, we live in the existing home now. Um, and so we have not yet figured out what the next step would be for our family. Thank you for answering that. Appreciate of course. it. Um, are there any other comments? Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So I think this is perhaps what many of you are here for. Um, thank you for your patience and sticking around till 7:45. Um, item D is Ordinance 2022-03. This is an introduction, prohibiting the sale and distribution of kratom and Delta 8 within 1,000 feet of a school, playground, or daycare. Um, for so this is an introduction. We will be taking a vote because it will allow us to authorize um, the advertising so that when it comes back to us at our next meeting, um, it'll be the, the final vote. So um, can I um, ask Mr. Rice to introduce this legislation? Um, thank you. So just... Um, what's in front of the board is... Uh, 
Commissioner Mulroney just stated is ordinance, proposed ordinance 2022-03, which, um, you know, essentially establishes a 1,000-foot uh, uh, protected area uh, from a, uh, a church, from, from schools, daycares, and uh, playgrounds. Uh, which would prohibit any dealer from offering or exposing for sale Creighton, a Creighton product or a Delta 8 product. And then secondly, it prohibits anywhere uh, the sale of these products to anyone under the age of 21. Uh, just so the public is aware, the way ordinances work in Radnor Township, Radnor's a, what's called a home rule municipality. <clears throat> and a home rule municipality gets approved by the voters, and that was done in the late 70s. And what was approved by the voters in the late 70s is the township's home rule charter, which you can find online. That's our law that we have to follow. Other cities and other townships have other codes that they have to follow. So the township's home rule charter has a procedure for ordinances. First step is what's occurring tonight is an introduction. And if it, the board votes to approve the introduction, it then gets advertised for a public hearing. Uh, it'll be advertised in the newspaper. There'll be a public hearing um, in front of the board. And at that point, um, there'll be more comments. There'll be people pro and con, I'm sure, at the public hearing. Anyone that wants to submit any information between now and the public hearing, uh, it's a legislative process. So there may be lobbyists here who are lobbying for a certain uh, issue, but if we don't follow that procedure, then we have a invalid ordinance. So we're gonna follow the procedure that's in the Home Rule Charter. Introduction's the first step, advertising is the second step uh, in the newspaper. And I would think the earliest that this could come back to the board would be at your next meeting, March 28th, in two weeks. So um, just to, so to clarify, John, when you say a public meeting, that will be held during the Board of Commissioners meeting yes. in two weeks. It's not a special meeting, but it will be considered the public meeting for adoption of this it would ordinance be, well, at our next meeting. Correct. So that's what's in front of the board tonight. Um, you know, you would need to do a motion to move this forward, take more public comment if, you know, if need be, and uh, that would authorize us to be then advertised. Then I will start um, asking if I have a motion. So moved. And a second. Thank you. Uh, second. I will open it up first to Commissioner Comment. Is this thing on? Yeah. Okay. So you know, it, I also want to add that um, you know, uh, daycares and schools that are located inside of churches that covers the church. So that's important to note. And 1,000 feet is a lot more than what you give it credit for. So just take that into consideration as well. Um, you know, it's important, I feel, for the township to do its part to look after the welfare of everyone in the township, including its minors. So that's what this ordinance will do. And I think it does it very well. And, um, you know, I do believe, you know, I, I was listening to all sides of the story uh, during the town hall that we had on March 3rd. And, um, you know, I think that there is room for consideration for Kratom to be looked at and studied even more. But I think that if people are to use it, it should be used um, in a way where they would go to a doctor, get a prescription, and be managed on it rather than going into a store and just you know, buying something that is not regulated, we don't know the dosing, anyone could take it at any time, any age right now. Um, I showed my kids the packaging, each of them individually. I have a nine-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 15-year-old. I showed them the uh, packaging of that uh, Lucky Charms with a Z, and each of them said they would have eaten it without any question. Um, the ingredients are on the back, labeled very tiny and I mean there is a marijuana leaf but I don't know any kid who would see this fanciful beautiful misleading package and not just dig in and take the whole thing so um, you know like I said we have a responsibility and uh, we're taking that very seriously
Other commissioner comment? Me? Somebody else want to go? Okay. <laughs> um, you know if you're going to go down the line or not. So um, at first I'd like to thank um, Commissioner Jones for all her hard work on this and all the residents that participated. I was um, fortunate enough to, to uh, attend the community forum as well as our Board of Health and I'd like to thank them as well. I think they did a, a fantastic job of evaluating and then provided us with um, some very uh, salient information to help us make our decisions. Um, I would, I'm wondering if we could include in here somehow that the Board of Health also advised on this, but I don't want to muddy the waters too much, so, um, when it comes to the ordinance. You know, I, um, I remember when my two boys got their wisdom teeth out probably six years ago. And we left, they had to got it done on the same day. And we left with two giant bottles of oxycodone. And um, that's just what they did at the time. And I was a paranoid wreck having that in my house the entire time. And was so glad when really neither one of them uh, were in enough pain that they needed it. And could, was so happy to take it and dump it in the box downstairs uh, outside of our police station, which if anybody doesn't know, there is a drug deposit box that is down there. So if there are drugs that you don't want anymore, they can be deposited at any time um, down there safely. So, um, you know, I am uh, concerned about this. I am, uh, you know, a, a mother. You know, my boys are older now. But, um, you know, I am a mother who had kids who went to the middle school, who went to elementary school, who did walk to Wayne. Um, and this is, you know, definitely something that I don't think enhances our community in any way. Um, I applaud those, I applaud um, our solicitor Rice for putting together this ordinance because I think that, as I said at our last meeting, we need something that's gonna stick. And I think that this will stick. Um, and I think that this gives us the tools that we need. It gives our, um, it gives Mr. Kachansky the tools he needs in order to make and evaluate decisions when um, organizations or, or businesses come in and um, this is what they propose to, um, to sell. So uh, Anna Marie is right, a thousand feet is a lot. Um, it's more than you think. It is, what did you say, uh, Commissioner Myers, as the crow flies. So it is a you know, radius point and then goes out a thousand feet from there. Um, it, uh, I think it gives us a lot of, uh, it gives us teeth to um, an ordinance and I will be very happy to support this as well as the fact that it cannot be sold to minors um, here in the township. So um, I applaud all those and all the residents who made their, um, you know, made their feelings known. I, I think that this is um, the best way for us to handle this as a township and uh, to move forward and make sure that um, we are protecting and not only uh, protecting our students and, and our children in the community. I'd also like to add that I think what we need to do is petition the state. The state needs to regulate this. Um, and I think that all those residents, we've had so many come out, uh, so many people sign petitions. The state has the bandwidth and the knowledge and the resources to do the evaluation and to make this a regulated drug. So um, Commissioner Larkin mentioned that at our last meeting. Um, I think that that's something, and, and maybe once we kind of get done with this portion of the, um, you know, of this, uh, dealing with this issue, that that's something maybe we as a township can start to talk about, or, um, you know, we have such an, uh, a, you know, an organized and engaged uh, community a group of community members that that's maybe something that they could take on and we could uh, collaborate to get that done and take that to the state level. So I'll be supporting this evening and thank you all for who, who participated in making this happen. Thank you. I will um, just very briefly add to that that that's exactly what I wanted to say. Um, I think that we probably want to get the process started to get a petition to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We, we really as a township are not in a position to regulate drugs at, at large. That's not what townships do. That's not what Radnor does. This is an ordinance that is not intended to prohibit a, um, anything, kratom, whatever, throughout the entirety of the township, which is a sort of legally dubious position for anyone to take, I suspect, at the municipal level. Um, if what the group wants, and we, we hear you, I promise we're getting all of your emails, we, we hear you, 
Um, if what the group wants is to ban Kratom, then the people to talk to is the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And there's a process, and there is a role for the township to have in that process. We can spearhead for the community. We can get the petition started. The first name on the petition can be Radnor Township. And then we can hold a petition period where we leave it open for 30 days or something for residents to come and sign. Um, there may be a way to do it virtually. I don't know. I frankly haven't petitioned the Secretary of Health in the past. But the concept would then be that you have a united front to talk to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and put it in front of the people whose jobs it is full time to regulate drugs in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and let them ultimately make the decision. And then it would have an effect that is not just here in Radnor Township, which you know we're bordered by Upper Marion, by Tredyffrin. There's lots of different places that you can go to get Kratom and just bring it right back into Radnor Township. This is not going to be the only place you would have the comfort that you were no longer in a little Radnor bubble. You would instead be in a state where it was an issue that you wouldn't have to deal with. So that's going to be my suggestion. It's a little bit beyond our brief t today, but uh, we can maybe talk about that at the next meeting. Other commissioners? No, I'd actually like to hear from a, a pediatrician. Well, um, basically they've said what I was, uh, each, each person's gone down the line and I've had additions to each comment and they've now all been said. Um, I do agree that this is an issue that's larger than we can do. We have no way to uh, analyze Kratom to figure out is it Kratom, is it Kratom plus, who knows what. The uh, Delta HTHC is known to have huge amounts of contaminants. There have been huge bacterial outbreaks that have come from it, plus there are all kinds of heavy metals and just funky stuff in there. Um, we don't have the ability to check that. Um, in fact, you know, it, you would like it to be a United States, the FDA being the ones that would take that over. But there is a huge Kratom lobby, and they're very powerful. Um, and the FDA, actually the DEA, hasn't been able to get forward any uh, legislation. Uh, there is a representative, Tracy Pennycook, in Pennsylvania who has legislation ready. Um, it demands testing for purity. It demands dosages. It demands some, or, or she's hoping to add some changes in packaging that shouldn't be packaged to minors that would have some prescription tops so that your pets can't just chew it up and eat it, your kids can't get into it, that kind of thing. Um, some age regulation, which obviously we, we have in our as well. But um, uh, I think that regulation is what the substance needs. In the meantime, we can do what we can, and I'm in support of this ordinance. Thank you. Um, so I don't particularly like this ordinance. There's a lot that I don't like with it. Um, I didn't particularly like the process. I made that clear to a bunch of people. Uh, personally, I would have preferred it to be a zoning ordinance. Um, I would have preferred that this only be allowed to be sold in office space and pretty much off of Lancaster Avenue, but this is what it is. Um, so I guess this is a definition of what a good compromise is. Um, either everybody's happy, which is the best compromise, or people are not everyone's happy, but I think this is all something that we're going to be able to live with. Um, the things that I do like, um, I do like seeing everybody out here. I do like your advocacy. I do like the phone calls. Whether we agree, whether we disagree, you're engaged, and that's important for a community and for a democracy. Um, I do like the fact that this allows for safe passage, so we're not going to arrest the mailman or the UPS driver if they're, or someone going from one town to another. Um, the th other things that, oh, and I also like the fact that this is not going to be in Garrett Hill, uh, where they'll be flashing blinking lights saying vape shop and buy your Kratom or THC here. Um, what I, going back to things that I don't like again, I don't like the fact that this is, that we're being reactive to a situation. I brought something like this up two years ago uh, when it came to medicinal marijuana. I don't really have much of a problem with medicinal marijuana. I'm not going to get in the way of a doctor um, or someone that has cancer or AIDS and tell them what they can and cannot take. This, uh, and you held up the Lucky Charms and all that other stuff, this is a little bit different. This is 100% recreational. 
Um, that being said, um, I did try to do something, uh, at least have a conversation about this two years ago. Um, it didn't really go anywhere. But while we're on this topic, if we are going to ban things such as Delta 8 and Kratom, that's fine. Uh, I don't know if the board, uh, maybe I shouldn't even bring it up, but if the board would have a, an appetite to ban or disallow safe injection sites or any facility property that would be a safe haven host and facilitate the use of illicit drugs, including non-prescribed opiates. So, so I, would, I would like to, to, to add a motion uh, that we put uh, the, the illegal, um, you know, that we ban safe injection sites to some language that I spoke about. So I would ask for a second I, on that. I hear a motion. Is there a second? Second. Calling a vote on the motion to add ban banning? Restricting? Yeah, I mean, to disallow safe injection sites or any facility or property that would be a safe haven, host, and facilitate the use of illicit drugs, including non-prescribed opiates. Can I, can I just interject here for a minute? Well, can we take the vote? Or well, let me, let me just, mm -hmm. first of all, this is not on the agenda. So if you want to put it on the agenda, I think you need to put it on the 24 hours in advance. This is a separate topic, uh, Sean. Um, it, it needs to come on the agenda as a separate item, just like this is on the agenda as a separate item. I've had so many. I've had so many commissioners mm -hmm. bury stuff and stuff that I put. We'll bring it back. No, no, no. I, I, I would like to have a vote on this. If it, if it doesn't pass muster, it doesn't pass muster. Yeah, but that's 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 but not that, point. Yeah, I'm not going to call a vote if I'm being told by a solicitor that it's not appropriate well, without advertising. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, so, rescind, I'm not rescinding the vote, though, Commissioner Moroni. Well, let me explain why my recommendation okay, is that you bring it back. Okay. Because the Sunshine Act requires that you post things that you're going to vote on 24 hours in advance. And I think all of you are aware of that because I've spoken all, to all of you about that in the past. So that's why I would recommend bring it back on the 28th. It can be posted way in advance of the 28th. But okay. the state changed the Sunshine Act this past June okay. precisely for this kind of thing where things were brought up. We want to buy a new truck. It's $100,000. It. A motion okay. was made. Let, let me, can, so can that, I amend my motion? That's my advice. Sure. Can we amend, pardon me, Commissioner Murray. Can I amend this that we bring a similar wordage or verbiage up at the next meeting? Um, I don't think we need to vote on that. Yeah, you any can commissioner ask for can that. bring up any item. Any commissioner can add an right. item to the okay. agenda. Then I will, I will so add that I will item. ask you yeah. to submit that for next Okay. Uh, well, let me just follow up with my comments, and I apologize. And I don't want it so to be you, perceived that I am hijacking we withdraw? anything. Will yes, you I, will, I will. Yes, I will gladly withdraw it uh, in hopes that we can put it on a future agenda. Done Absolutely. Okay, Thank you. Thank Continue. you. Um, so, yeah. So, again, look, I'll just s summarize. Uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you for doing this uh, and being part of the process. Um, this does have my vote. Uh, I am supportive of it. Um, but if we're really going to protect our kids, which is why we're here, we need to look at not this picture, but a larger picture, and be proactive. If it's vaping, you know, I would love to see, and these are pipe dreams, but to raise the tobacco age to 99 years old in Pennsylvania, and then we wouldn't have a, probably wouldn't have a, a Wawa uh, across from St. Catharines. But those are a lot of things, but in the meantime, thank you to you guys, uh, John, Bill, I know it's been a lot, but thank you for putting the ordinance together under such quick time as well. It's, those are my comments. I'll keep my comments brief. Um, you know, similar to some of the comments we heard tonight, uh, you know, this to me, this this uh, ordinance change doesn't go far enough. Um, I would I would support a complete ban of the sale of these substances within Ryder Township. However, I was given the the guidance, um, you know, that what we have before us, and just to answer some of the concerns that were raised during public comments, some of the the, the ordinance change in front of us is as far, you know probably as far as we can go um, within within our our, um, our authorities so for that reason I am going to support it I, I, I do like some of the comments I've heard from the from my colleagues on the board that we're going to now move forward with a petition I would hope that petition is ready by the next meeting as well 
Um, but you know that petition, I would hope, goes along the lines of the seven states that have banned the substance within the state or the 12 countries in Europe that have banned the, the sale and consumption of the substance. That's what I would like to be petitioning our um, state and, and federal representatives to push forward on. Well, thank you all. Um, I will echo the sentiments of my colleagues. We are very grateful for all of the participation in this community. We did hear you. Um, we ha are moving uh, forward with this ordinance the way it's drafted because we believe it's the, um, uh, the most solid approach that um, a ban would probably be challenged and we'd likely lose. Um, so if we can restrict it, uh, at this level where it will not be near our children's daycare, schools, and parks, and you have to be 21 as if you're buying cigarettes and beer. It seems to me it's um, where we can go with it. And then I do encourage all of you to um, continue to bring your concerns to the higher levels of government who have the ability to do what you um, really are seeking, which is the ban. And as you've heard, um, this board is willing to uh, lead the charge and support that effort. So um, thank you, everyone. I know it's been, um, people have, been, have uh, brought their passion and, um, and their engagement to this. So um, sure. I just have a quick question, and um, maybe Mr. Rice, you know the answer, or Mr. White. So um, the, the settlement with the opioids, so with Johnson & Johnson and all the I forget all the people that are part of that. And there's money, and we voted to be, um, to support that, and I forget exactly what the language was, but in some way be a party to that, um, so that when there was a settlement and the money would come through to the county, that it would be spread through the municipalities that were part of it. Was that, remember no. we voted on that a, a couple, several meetings ago, maybe like, it was yeah. probably back, it was last year, the yeah. end of last year. There was, uh, the, end, the end of last year, I think there was a deadline of January 4th for municipalities that wanted to participate and sign up. Um, the more that signed up on a countywide basis, the more the pot of money would be to be distributed to the county. In Delaware County, it was going to the county. It wasn't going to individual municipalities. So, this board and many other boards signed up. Uh, I don't know what the status of that is because the county, um, Delaware County had some special counsel that was working on that. I know there was still some uh, back and forth with that issue around the, uh, during the beginning of the year, but that's all the township did. There was no guarantee that any money would come to Radnor Township. It was going to come on a countywide basis to the county who, is running the, the drug and alcohol programs in the township and all the townships. It would filter down. There'd be a benefit to the township in, in that way. So but, our, our participation in that will hopefully bring funding to the county and they can use, because one of the things I'm getting at, education, because one of the things we heard certainly in the uh, community presentation, that the, the community program that was um, held, as well as at the Board of Health, the importance of education as well, because while we can enact these things, I think some of my colleagues also added, you know, that they're there are other places where it can happen. So the idea of education, um, I just didn't know if eventually, um, you know, I, I know we have a, a sort of an in with the new Department of Health at, uh, at the county level. So, you know, as education starts to develop or, or that money starts to come through, um, I mean, I you know, can, that would be something we would participate in. Yeah, and I, and I can see um, whether funds have been released. Um, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was doing something different. Um, there were certain municipalities that were parties to the lawsuit, and they had a little bit more, and Delaware County was one of the parties, but every municipality was asked to participate and sign up. So I'm not sure where that is, Lisa, but you know we'll look into that and, and get some information to the board about the status of those funds. Thank you. And just to add, Lisa, that's a good point or a good topic to bring up. Um, education is going to be the next step after this ordinance, and um, that could happen at the county level. But you know, we would also like to work with 
uh, Chief Flanagan on creating uh, education around Kratom, adding that to the wonderful job he does within our schools. Um, and we will be talking about that. So just wanted to let you all know that. Any additional commissioner comment? Any public comment? Yeah, just, just come to the mic, please. Really You're going to have to come to the mic, please. I'm just really concerned this is uh, a medical emergency. It's a health emergency. Uh, and uh, I wonder if perhaps the board might consider holding a special meeting such that we could vote on the ordinance for within the next 10 days? We're going to bring that. We need to advertise for a certain amount of time, so we'll bring it back to our next meeting uh, in two weeks. Thank, right. thank you. This is, this is more a question. Uh, Doug Blasey again from 215 Upland Way. The, one of your whereas is, uh, says it's, uh, these materials have been, have been uh, banned by local government as well in some areas. And I'm wondering if there might be a legal opinion as to why we're restricted from doing that. So when the ordinance comes up, I, I wholeheartedly support the idea of the petition and what you're doing here, but I'd like to know why we couldn't do more. Are, are we, is our home rule charter limited? Is it a, simply a resource that we don't have the, somehow we think the inspection capacity? What, what is the reason we couldn't do more? And if, if it's a good reason, it supports the ordinance as it is. Thank you. Mike Lake from the fourth. Again, thank you for all your attention to this issue. Um, my question is why are we limited at a thousand feet, right? If these were cell phone towers, there would be dead spots within the township. Why are we allowing dead spots of allowing advertising or sales of these products? So is there something limiting us to 1,000 feet? I wasn't joking earlier when I said, let's add an extra zero. If we make it 10,000 feet, it's problem solved. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pat Campbell. Uh, I represent CB CBD Kratom, which is the tenant, uh, the property. I'm with the law firm. I represent um, the tenant of the property, which is a resident. I, thank you. Thank you. Um, solicitor, can you weigh in here, please? Well, the, the tenant's a property owner in the township. Uh, I would, you know, this is a public meeting. I don't think it's ever a good idea to shut down somebody that has a property interest in the township, whether you disagree with them or not. There's going to be a public hearing, um, and anyone that wants to speak um, will be entitled to speak. This gentleman is entitled to speak. There's no reason to shut him down. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Again, my name is Pat Campbell, and I do represent 218. Um, so I'm the parliamentarian for the meeting. And if people want to disrupt this, um, you know, they will be removed. Let's let them speak. Let's be civil. We, you may all disagree with them. I'm sure you do. Um, but you've all had the opportunity with very little limitations to say what you wanted to say. So, um, Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Rice. So, the concern that we have here is that we are a tenant. We signed a lease with, that complies with the current uses under the current zoning laws. And there is now something that is in the works that is essentially going to shut us down, the 1,000 foot rule is going to shut us down. And um, that's, I've heard everybody talk about democracy and, and the democratic process. That's not being democratic. We have a vested interest in this. We signed a long-term lease. Frankly, every, a lot of what I've heard is misunderstood. We do not sell Lucky Charm shaped packages. If you walk into a CBD Kratom store, it's a very professional uh, store. There's nothing in there that's enticing to kids. We have trained consultants in there. They're trained to spot fake ID. We comply. We self-regulate. Um, we don't sell anything to anybody under 18, and we don't sell inhalants to any, anyone under 21. 
We don't have packaging that is enticing to children. We provide products that are vetted, that we list the ingredients, we have dosages, they're there for um, certainly recreational use at times, but the vast majority of people that use Kratom use it for medicinal purposes, mostly pain management. There was a study done by John Hopkins University of 2,700 users of the Kratom product. 91% of them use it for pain. Some 60% of them use it for anxiety and some, another 60% use it for depression. There's people who have multiple reasons they use it. That's why the numbers don't add up. But the fact, the point is that we have not been included in the process. We weren't even allowed to speak at the Board of Health meeting. And that's not fair, that's not democratic, and that's not American. What we would suggest is to put the brakes on this and to allow this process, include us in the process, allow us to collaborate. You'll see that we don't sell to children. We don't market to children. We're not a threat to children. The, the typical Kratom user is 40 years of age. He, has co he, he or she has college education, 60% of Kratom users are women. And so this is not a clientele that's gonna pose a threat any more than a clientele of a beer store is gonna pose a threat to children in schools and churches. I would ask that the board not introduce this bill, not put it on a two week fast track and allow us the opportunity to participate in this process we feel that if we collaborate with you, we'll come up with solutions to your concerns that are constructive, that allow this product to be used in a safe and effective manner for the benefit of many of the township residents. And everybody knows that you can go up the street to a different township and go to the news agency across the street from the Berwyn Tavern, and you can, get, you can probably get your Lucky Charm packages there. Okay, we don't do that. We're self-regulated. Okay, we don't sell things that we don't know where it came from. So we think we're a good solution to this problem. We think we have benefits to add. We think we can be a, a, group, a good community partner in Radnor Township, and we ask that you give us a chance. Thank you. Hi again, um, I'm Kate Hart from 520 Meadowbrook Circle. The day that this store opened, I drove by with my 11-year-old son. And we took a look in the window, and what did we see? They don't market to children. Here's some candies. So we've got caramels, maple creams, almond caramels. Oh, wait. Right in the window, right where the kids for Walk to Wayne were taking selfies with the eight-foot-tall marijuana leaf, that you never got a permit for this building, you never filed a business license, you never went to the sign committee, but you have 49 locations. You knew exactly what you were doing. I bet that if I did a right to know right now, that that contractor that you used at your media location, because I know his name, I bet you if I did a right to know on your current permit, it's the same guy. So he knew exactly what he was doing. We don't want you here. You are catering to children. See this? This is soda. So your child, Kratom Seltzer, Kratom Soda. You're right, it doesn't have a leprechaun on it, but it's candy, and they sell cookies right next to it. So you're telling me you're not marketing to children? That's absolutely ridiculous. I have photos right here that I took with my 11-year-old of candy and cookies. So don't believe what these people are saying. They are drug dealers. They have found a loophole to sell drugs that are banned in seven states. The fact that Thailand has outlawed this and declared it a you know, Schedule C substance, come on, people. We need to do what's best for our community. And I think we all know what the answer is. Get these people out. We don't want them here. We don't need this problem in Wayne. Thank you. Any other public comment?
Hi, Heather, I spoke earlier tonight. I just want to remind people, they duped this community. They left business cards at the door for weeks and didn't respond to anyone. There was an article that the owners of this store actually said, we only want to thrive or open businesses in a community that wants us. We don't want them. I don't want to have the risk of this and candy and seltzer here. So I would really ask the board vote for this and that they started this process by completely duping us and having contractors with unmarked cars in the middle of the night doing work, not responding to township contacts and cards that were left. They duped us, we clearly don't want them, and I want our kids and community put first before a business that comes in and on day one doesn't do the right thing. Elizabeth Stahl, 218 Windermere. I, may I ask a question to the board? During public comment, we hear from you, but we don't respond back. With okay, so answers. I just um, have a question, but you don't have to respond. So I, it's my understanding that the township has asked, um, has asked you to uh, cover the sign, and um, that has still not been done. So if this company wants to work with the township, they can't even comply to covering the sign, and they're continuing to get free advertising with the sign up. Thank you very much. Any further public comment? I think we're ready to call the vote. All in favor say aye. aye. Pass unanimously. Thank you all for your time. So, well, thank you for all of that. Um, we are moving into the next um, agenda item, which is, pardon me while I find my way. I'm actually going to call a, I'm going to ask for a motion for a three minute. Um, okay, second. All in favor say aye for a recess. Thank you.
Bill White. I'm going to call the meeting back to order. Thank you all for sticking around. Um, we are moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is um, Ordinance 2021-10. This is for adoption amendment of Article 28 of the zoning ordinance of the Township of Radnor establishing certain general and specific standards relating to the location, placement, construction, and maintenance of tower-based wireless communications uh, facilities, non-tower wireless communications facilities, and small wireless communications facilities, providing further for the regulation of such facilities with in the public rights of way and outside the public rights of way, providing for the enforcement of said regulations and for providing for an effective date. Uh, John Rice, can you lead us into this? Okay. Is um, this you? Well, Bill and I were Bill? Flip, flipping a coin to see who would. It's uh, all. Want, yep. Bill. This. Bill says it's you, John. Do this. So, so this is an ordinance which you know, has been in the pipeline for a while. It was advertised once before. We received some additional comments from Delaware County Planning Commission. So, and then we re-advertised re it for tonight for adoption. Um, Mike Roberts is here from Dan Cohen's office, really the author, uh, you know, of this ordinance and has, you know, went through it with the Planning Commission. And uh, I don't know if the board has any additional uh, questions. It's comprehensive. It's going to wipe out what you currently have on the books for this type of a use, and it's, uh, I think, state-of-the-art. So um, it's a public hearing and up for uh, board approval. Lisa, do you have any comments on this issue? So you know this is my, my thing. I'm sorry. Um, so I just want to know what were the comments from the Planning Commission, like from Delaware County Planning Commission? Did it change any of the things that we had, I mean, there were some specific things that we had done with it, uh, things to try to prevent or to manage the small cells. So I just wanted to know uh, what those changes were. Absolutely. Um, Mike Roberts uh, from the Cohen Law Group, we're a special counsel to the township on this. Um, really, the major changes, and John, feel free to, to weigh in if, if I miss anything here. Um, the major changes that we have here from the last draft really relate to permitting of the small wireless facilities more than anything, um, establishing a um, five-year permit term and then requiring recertification of the permit upon expiration of that term. Um, that's something that's echoed in state law as well um, under Act 50, where um, that five-year term is required but then that recertification is something that has to be done again um, following expiration of that term. So it comes back to the township after that permit term expires. 
um, and they have to recertify compliance with all of the requirements of the ordinance um, for any existing small wireless facility that would be in the public rights of way. That was it? Um, the other small thing <laughs> um, is relating to, we had had a discussion about obsolete equipment. Um, someone's installing a new facility and there is um, existing equipment there that has been obsoleted or abandoned or is generally on the pole that doesn't need to be there. Um, if a, uh, an installer is putting up a new small wireless facility and they find third party equipment that has been abandoned or obsolete, um, it's something that we had discussed where they do not have the authority themselves um, to remove any equipment that does not belong to them, but they have to notify the township of that um, equipment being in existence and you could then pursue um, whoever the owner of that equipment would be and have them remove it in, in uh, accordance with the code. So those are really the only small changes since, since the last time I was here. Great, thank you very much and thank you for entertaining all my, and educating <laughs> me so much about this. I really appreciate it. No, absolutely. Are there any, any other questions? Other commissioners, questions for Mike? A lot of this happened before I was here, but um, I was watching, so I was okay. just at home watching. Um, there was a provision that these uh, mini cell towers or whatever have to be labeled with the, uh, you know, the, the owner, like so that if you go out to the street, um, you could tell who owns the device. Correct. Yeah. So okay. that there's language requiring. I remember you talked about it, but I couldn't yeah, remember where it ended up. Yeah, this was extensive discussion as yeah. well. Um, there's a requirement for signage that shows the owner of the facility as well as their contact information. Um, the intent is for that to, to apply both um, moving forward as well as retroactively for any existing facilities that there would be a tagging requirement there as well. I don't know if this is a question for you, but I'm just mm -hmm. curious. Um, would these WCFs eventually take the place of like? A big tower. I'm, I'm the perfect person for oh, that question, okay. <laughs> for better or worse for me. But um, yes and no. Uh, as is often the case in this area, there's some, some interplay with the way that these facilities work. Um, large cell towers, what we call macro towers, provide kind of baseline coverage. Um, so they give you a cell signal of some kind. Um, you see most wireless providers advertise that they have 99% coverage of the entire country. That means that you have some cell signal everywhere. Um, what small wireless communications facilities are intended to address are gaps in capacity. So areas where there is particularly high demand, where the existing cell signal diminishes um, in, in times of peak activity or simply you know, residential areas where there's a lot of traffic. Small wireless facilities boost that signal um, and they can provide additional capacity to a more discrete area. So say there's a two block area um, where there's dense commercial activity. Um, during the work day, there's high traffic. That small cell facility would cover that small area. A large macro tower would cover, say, a mile and a half, two miles of coverage. Um, over the long term, it is likely that this is where the industry is heading. Um, more discreet, more targeted areas. Um, but right now, you need both of them um, to work together. You would liken it to like a tile in your home versus your, your big uh, internet box. I don't even know, I'm, I'm bad with technology, <laughs> but. No, I, I, th I think you're right. Um, it, it would be a one specific area of service versus a large portion of the township that would be served. Line, line of sight. Line of sight, exactly. So, you know, I would be the tower serving you, but I may not reach all the way over to um, Steve over there, for, for example. Hmm? Can, can, can I just clarify the, the previous question on um, signage? Mm -hmm. So in, in the ordinance, where, where does it require the signage to be listed? Does it have to be on the box? Because, I, you know, I think everybody's thinking traditional Mm -hmm. um, you see, you'll see the brown box on the pole. Um, you know, a company that I've been speaking with is talking about subsurface, putting the equipment subsurface. Mm -hmm. So then, is it would they be okay? If the signage would go on the metal that would be, f um, you know, right up on ground level. So that would really be something that I would say is in the discretion of the township more than anything. Um, pole mounted would probably be your best bet. Um, just because that is at eye level, it's somewhere that would be readily available. But when it comes to when the application would come in, you'd be able to say 
you know, this is where the signage would make the most sense. Um, so, so it doesn't have to be on the box, per se? It just no, has to be no, it just has to be on the facility. Somewhere. Got it. Okay. Do some of these towers emit um, radioactive waves? Uh, every single one of them okay. emits radioactive so, waves. So thanks. And, and I'm not asking for how much or, or this yeah. or that. So my, my question or concern is this, mm -hmm. is that company A puts it up, and then company B says ours is better. And then company C says, well, we have new technology. And uh, so the houses on my street mm -hmm. are pretty com compact. It's a densely populated neighborhood. That, you know, what's to prevent someone saying, well, we have the right of way, we can do it, that you have four poles now, you know, within a 20 foot area where the neighbors don't want it. It's uh, an eyesore because it's now in front or behind their house. And they do emit radio waves, and I don't know how much. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that, it, that, that they are dangerous, but it could be. Mm -hmm. And so to the, you know, to the, uh, I'm, I'm just focused and I'm, I worry about the, the homeowner uh, who now has pretty much no uh, say in his, in his or her property rights. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know, I understand what an easement is and five feet and all that other good stuff, but. Mm -hmm. In theory, um, do they have to be 10 feet apart from another or 30? I mean, is, so if company A wants to put one here, what's the distance that company B would have to put one up? Mm -hmm. is, is, there, is that in there or not? I didn't, I, it's, it's a lot for me to read. No, I understand. I, I'll be honest, I don't understand it particularly well. <laughs> uh, and that's why I'm just gonna defer to you, because uh, as a, not as a commissioner, mm -hmm. just as a, as a resident, as a, dad it's someone that wants to go outside and kick the ball around with this you know kid or have a baseball catch or something mm -hmm. uh, I don't want the eyesore or multiple towers emitting something that we don't know how safe or dangerous it is within a small area so if you could address those questions I would appreciate it absolutely and I, I think that touches on a few different issues so I'll, I'll address them kind of one by one um, the issue of Citing in particular how far apart things are, where they can be located, that's really something that is best addressed via the design manual, which is part of this as well. Um, I, I don't believe that a minimum distance separation is in there right now, um, but it's something that we could certainly add. Um, and that's not part of the ordinance itself, so I wouldn't let that hold you back from adopting the ordinance. The, the way the design manual works, it's something that um, the zoning officer is able to amend as they see fit. Um, in the issue of radio frequency, as I think you allude to, the township doesn't really have a whole lot of control over radio frequency. Um, radio frequency emission standards are something that's set by the FCC, um, and they put out standards back in 1996 that all of these facilities have to comply with. Um, part of those standards, though, is the fact that the radio frequency emissions are taken as a whole, both for the proposed facility as well as any facilities that are nearby. So if someone is proposing a facility that is near a second facility or a third facility or something along those lines, as part of their certification of compliance with those radio frequency emission standards, they have to show that the facility um, in conjunction with the emissions from any of those other facilities does not exceed the FCC standards. Um, the penalties for exceeding those standards are harsh. Um, really, if a company exceeds those standards knowingly and continues to do so, what happens is they get their FCC license revoked, meaning that they wouldn't be able to provide wireless service anymore. So it would effectively shut them down. Um, so it's a severe penalty. Um, they do have to certify compliance with those standards as part of any application for any of these facilities. So if you erect the pole, mm -hmm. or there's an existing telephone pole, and you want to put one of those disks or whatever on there, mm -hmm. company A wants to do that. Now company B, can they say, well, the pole's already there, we're going to put ours as well? That's why I'm saying that it could create a lot. So I would like to see only one, um, uh, one company or one, you know, whatever it is per, per, per pole, and then those poles or whatever would have to be spaced out 50 or 100 feet. So you may not be able to get two technologies in there, mm -hmm. and that is to preserve a quality of living. Um, so it, you know, it looks good. Um, as well as safety issues. And then I worry about, and for the most part, you can get these things done on the street, but there are some crazy little, um, like I have 
actually my neighbor has a telephone pole in their backyard which mm -hmm. So you'd have to get there to put that up. So you have to walk across property lines. I don't necessarily know that you'd have to dig up anybody's uh, yard, but that could be a situation if their wires or their electric is done underground, correct? And then yeah. do you have the right to go over five feet to dig those wires up to get that? So in terms of, are you referring to encroachment onto like private property? Some, yeah, so I know that one, so one of my neighbors, or one of my friends is, uh, actually lives in Jake's ward. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why he bought his house was because the, the wires were underground. He didn't want to see any light poles. Or he, there's a light pole, but he didn't want to see any telephone wires. Mm -hmm. So what would happen if um, they had to get underground? And they had to go more than five feet into the property. Do you have to, as a property owner, give up the, those rights and allow no. them? Or? Okay. No. So, and, and mm -hmm. this bears to a larger point that, that may be of benefit to mention. Um, the requirements of Act 50 in particular, and I keep referencing this, it relates to small wireless facilities in the rights of way exclusively. Um, in terms of anything out of the rights of way on private property, that is solely a proprietary act. That is up to the property owner's discretion to allow or disallow okay. anything. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mike, I, I just wanna respond to one of Sean's points. <clears throat> so Sean, I, I'm not, I don't know if you're aware, and apologies if, if you understand and, and, and have seen this before, but when you have a box on a, on a utility pole, it's not always, you don't need multiple boxes. So within each box, you can have four tenants. So you can have carrier X, Y, and Z all in one box, which, you know, you, you don't need to have a, a multiple, a, a second pod on the next pole over. You know, they're all housed in, in that one, and then you have a, a vertical landlord, for lack of a better term. That's, that's great, but technology changes real fast, and that's what I'm worried about, where, you know, it becomes a slippery slope that you see real fast. I mean, we could have room so for people. In, great but, them, so. so in section but two, um, item number nine, it specifically states that no more than one small WCF shall be permitted on a single wireless support structure. So there's already only allowed to be one. Mm -hmm. to and that would refer to, just to clarify uh, Commissioner Abel's point as well, um, one small wireless facility would be a single antenna and a single cabinet, effectively. Um, that would be an installation that could serve multiple pro providers. Um, but they wouldn't be allowed to install five antennas on top of it. It's not something that they really would have the ability to do from an engineering standpoint. It would just overload the pole. But there would be one antenna, one cabinet, and they can put, as Commissioner Abel mentions, radio units for two or three providers in a single cabinet. Companies like Crown Castle infrastructure providers do that. Um, there's also a requirement that I'll mention for every facility that would require a new structure and that is that that applicant show that they can't put their facility on an existing pole of some kind or an existing tower or rooftop or whatever the case may be. We call that co-location. Um, they have to show that co-location is technically infeasible, meaning that they can't possibly do it and achieve whatever the goal would be of the facility. And do all the facilities or the WCFs apply the stealth technology or is it just some? They, can you repeat that, excuse me? Are, are all the WCFs um, considered stealth, uh, the stealth technology or, you know, like, are they all kind of hidden or how, how does that work? Because so I, I saw stealth technology is something that you do, but is that like done 100% of the time? So stealth technology is required. It's really something that is more so done for your large cell towers and your rooftop antennas. Um, what we would address for small wireless facilities, that would be something that's done through the design manual. And the reason that we have to do it that way is that design requirements for small wireless facilities in particular, particularly those in the rights of way, have to be objective, meaning that we can't use a blanket term like stealth technology. We have to say exactly what they have to do. Um, so something like a decorative pole, for example, would be um, an installation that would be stealth. Um, that would be something that looks like either a light pole or is a fluted black pole that would look like a more attractive pole installation and the antenna would be inside the pole itself. Um, the requirements for stealth technology as a defined term are really applying to your macro facility. So something on a rooftop, something on a cell tower, 
if an antenna is deployed on a rooftop, we want it to look like something that would naturally occur on a rooftop, whether that be, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of things naturally occurring on a rooftop, but air conditioning, you know, something that you would expect to see rather than an antenna protrusion just sitting up there as an eyesore. Mm -hmm. So, and Sean, just your point in um, this section four, um, under bullet or number two, there's a whole slew of specific specifications around new. So I guess there's not a lot we can do about existing, except make sure they're labeled and then people know. But there's a whole uh, slew of things like you can't, uh, it can't be within 10 feet of the edge of any driveway. It can't be uh, in the public rights of way directly opposite any driveway. So there's a whole slew of things that specific, and that's in, not in the ordinance per se, but in the design manual. And I'm, I mentioned on that front again, not to belabor the point, but the, the premise of the design manual is flexibility as well. So if something happens where the township goes, oh no, we don't want that to happen ever again, um, the premise of the design manual is that the zoning department can go in and just change that immediately to be effective immediately so the next installation isn't able to come in, um, have to wait for that ordinance amendment process for a design standard to change. We had all the questions. I'm going to move this. Uh, ask for a motion, please. So moved. Second. And second. Um, any other comments from commissioners? And do I have comments from the public? I will call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 No. And an A. Okay. Uh, passes six to one. Okay, moving on to Resolution 2022-31, authorizing the payment of change order number one to Donato, Spaventa, and Sons, Inc. for the work required for rerouting of the traffic signal cables <coughs> and additional sidewalks for the North Wayne Avenue, West Avenue, Poplar Avenue pedestrian improvement project in the amount of $62,626.60 to be funded from the proceeds of the 2019 general obligation bond. Mr. Norsini. Thank you, Commissioner Royal Rooney. Um, I guess as, if you live near Wayne, as you're aware, we've started our pedestrian safety project. As you can see, the various corners are having the ADA ramps installed. Excuse me. Part of this project, uh, aside from pedestrian push buttons, was to relocate the existing cabinet. Uh, there's actually a if you look in the packet, there's a picture. There's a rather large traffic signal controller box in front of Cornerstone. And as part of the easement agreement, we agreed with the owner to move that um, under the bridge next to a signal across from Poplar on North Wayne Avenue, where we have an existing signal. Uh, to do that, we have to uh, run cable down to that location. It was determined after the bid that that cable would be a sizable bundle. So there's a second picture I created in your packet. Um, the yellow line in that picture is an existing cable that runs down there. Uh, the red line is a representation of the 25 cables that would have to be uh, ran through the air to that controller. So what we found out is, A, it's rather large, and B, it would hang very close to the sidewalk. We do not have the ability to connect to that pole. We need PICO approval and PUC approval, which I believe we would get, but that would be some time from now. And if we wait for that, aside from the fact that it's always going to be unsightly, uh, we would run into delay claims on the project, uh, which would be sizable for two months. So what we're requesting is uh, in working with the subcontractor of Spaventa, which is Armor Electric, we found that the best route would be to run two three-inch cables across North Wayne, under the sidewalk, under the overpass, and then back over. Um, that cost of that includes the trenching in the street twice, so it's twice the width of that, uh, approximately 270 feet of double conduit run through that sidewalk. Uh, one of the 
the benefits of that is when I marked out that sidewalk, I don't know if anybody's ever walked under that bridge, that sidewalk was absolutely terrible. But I did leave some of the, a few of those blocks that were in reasonable shape there. Uh, the one benefit of this, uh, aside from getting the cables underground, is all new sidewalk will be in place from Station Avenue all the way down to Poplar. So uh, if it so pleases the board, we are requesting the approval of change order number one in the amount of $62,626.60. Thank you, Steve. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Norsini? I'm going to ask for a motion and a so second. Moved. Thank you. Um, is there a public comment? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, next, we will move to Ordinance 2022-04. This is an introduction amending the township zoning ordinance to permit parking within the front yard setback for single family and two family dwelling units located in residential zoning districts. Mr. Chachansky, sorry. Thank you, Madam President. Um, before you, Ordinance 2022-04 uh, proposes a minor change to the zoning ordinance uh, regulating parking where parking can be. Uh, I'd argue that it's a, it's a minor change but has significant benefits for our residents uh, by allowing single family and two family dwelling units to park uh, in their driveway. Uh, currently the code prohibits uh, parking in the front yard setback. Uh, many of the homes, um, South Devon, Conestoga Village, uh, Garrett Hill, uh, the houses are right to the setback line so there's no opportunity. Uh, many of these homes are, um, the garages are too small to fit their cars or it's a single car garage. Uh, and as a way of background, over the last month alone, uh, the department had to deny five applications. Uh, one application ultimately amended their plan, uh, significantly increasing the cost of the project. Uh, that did get approved. Uh, the other four are in a holding pattern. Um, current remedies would be to either abandon the product uh, or the project, uh, seek zoning hearing board approval, or uh, widen their driveways. Uh, in some cases, uh, the widening of the driveway obviously increases the cost of the project, um, but could also increase um, impervious coverage. Uh, in many cases, you could get impervious coverage that would be unregulated. Uh, the compounding effect could have some significant stormwater issues uh, if, because it would be under the 500 square foot threshold um, cumulatively that could start to create a problem. Um, so this ordinance would address that and allow for uh, some of these properties that have front-loaded garages uh, to utilize their driveway. Uh, in all the cases that we denied, there was significant room in the driveways to park two cars uh, without encroaching into the right-of-way, without encroaching onto the sidewalk, um, and allow the residents to convert their garages. Uh, I know over the course of the years we've seen these come in, but I think over the last month, just because of COVID and people doing projects, um, this really kind of came to the, the uh, ahead, and it's why I brought it in front of the board tonight. Um, I just have a clarifying question to um, sort of get an, an image in my, in my head about what you're talking about. So I live on a street. I have a driveway, no garage, um, very little front yard, just a privet and a flower bed. So if I pull my car into the driveway and stop after I cross the sidewalk, is that a violation of the current um, ordinance? Your property would be non potentially be non-conforming to the ordinance requirements, yes. And in many of the cases that we saw, it was a one-car garage um, that uh, the applicants indicated that they weren't using because they couldn't fit their cars in there. So they're parking in the driveway anyway but when they, they go to convert the garage, they're taking what is their one legal space and then eliminating that, creating the, the nonconformity and the need for a variance. Um, so for the original um, ordinance, what was the thinking to restrict that type of parking um, in a person's driveway, whether, that, whether or not they had a garage? Is there, I'm sure this is just, asking you to kind of make a guess about why this was passed 
I don't know. It was amended in 1992, um, so it dates back pretty far as to when the ordinance was amended. I didn't get a chance to um, you know, pull that ordinance to see what the thought process was. Um, my guess is to keep cars off of the street, um, but you know, m there's many properties, uh, South Devon, Conestoga Village, again, Garrett Hill, um, where there are nonconformities now and any kind of project to uh, utilize existing footprint without expanding the project, expanding the uh, footprint of the house um, would create further nonconformities. And I thought that that was uh, creating an undue hardship for our residents. So, but what you are not suggesting is that people would be allowed to pull in and park on their lawns. No, this would be to utilize the existing parking spaces or um, in some cases widen their driveway to get both parking spaces on the lot, um, but not on the lawn. It would have to be, per the code, requires a durable parking space uh, surface. So it would be an asphalt um, driveway or concrete of some sort. I think those are my questions. Anyone else? Could you uh, explain how the stormwater gets affected? I didn't follow that. So depending on the size of the project and the expansion of the driveway, if it's under 500 square feet, it would trigger stormwater management, which is fine. It's just more expensive to the residents. Um, if you're talking about a single garage space that you need to relocate and you locate it into a complying spot, you could probably put that space in alongside of your garage in under 500 square feet because a parking stall is uh, 10 by 20 so that would be 200 square feet and if you even doubled that to transition from the current driveway to the new parking space you'd still be at 400 square feet so in theory you could have 400 square feet of new impervious that does not trigger stormwater management requirements um, that is basically draining um, all stormwater but you could always have 400 square feet of new impervious without triggering that so if i just wanted to i don't know put on a tiny little basketball court or something on my property I still would not have to do any Correct. stormwater management. Correct. Okay. So this does not create a new loophole. It just you're saying that there's, I guess, an additional incentive that it creates to take advantage of an existing loophole. So if people want to convert their garages to more usable space, they then would need to expand the driveway um, per the code, current code. If this provision would not require them to exp necessarily require them to expand their driveway and in essence park where they're already parking now. So in many properties, you wouldn't see a noticeable difference. Cars are still parking in the driveway because they can't utilize their garages as we heard earlier. I understand. You're saying this removes the incentive to add that additional impervious. Correct. Okay, that's where my Correct. disconnect was. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm moving slow. Um, sorry. Please. Thanks. Um, so just two quick points. I know that we had a concern with a, a, a resident in Old Oaks. This would, that, this, is because you know it's because of a situation like that am i correct with that correct that was the first one that came up about mm -hmm. a month ago yep. um, and they were uh, able to uh, expand their driveway use a, uh, a paving material uh, but they had to widen the driveway and then go alongside the garage um, that was the first one and again we've seen these over the years but it hasn't been the influx that we saw over the last month okay um, and whenever i see this type of issue come up it it seems like we're dealing with a, a bigger issue. Okay, uh, that's number one. Number two is, um, how does this play into any kind of, um, of the Garrett Hill overlay? Because I know that there's some issues with um, like, you know, parking and you have to park in the back and all this other stuff. And then what would, if there is a question, um, what takes precedent, the Garrett Hill overlay or this ordinance? So uh, if you could speak to, I don't know if that's you or. Well, it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with Garrett Hill overlay, but um, in Garrett Hill in general, not necessarily the zoning district, okay, but so we this, consider uh, Garrett Hill. No, my question is, is this doesn't compete with any of the um, rules or regulation in that over, in that overlay? No, it's, this would only apply to, um, look at the specific language, I think it's the uh, Garrett Hill neighborhood district. Okay, so it does not. No, it does not, in fact, impact the uh, Garrett Hill, Garrett Avenue, or Garrett Hill, Conestoga Road districts. Why, why not? Because they do not permit um, single-family dwellings in those. Those are more commercial and mixed use. But there are a few single-family dwellings they are. in that area, so they would not? Well, so and we have that throughout the township where um, down on County Line Road we have uh, commercially zoned districts, but it's a row of uh, single-family homes. 
So I didn't want to start going down a rabbit hole of looking at all of the possible nonconformities and addressing every situation and look at the bigger picture I, of just I, I, single family sure. homes. Sure. So my concern is, and I get that and I appreciate that, but now it's one more thing that everyone else has that the people that live in the Garrett Hill overlay don't have, correct? It would probably just be the Garrett Hill, Garrett Avenue. Um, but, but yeah, yes. I mean, and, and that's fine. I, I'm, a portion of that. So the people that have single family dwellings on Garrett Avenue in the restricted part on the south side of, of Garrett Avenue, um, they are not going to be able to feel any benefits from this while the rest of the township will. A portion of that area of Garrett Avenue is Garrett Hill neighborhood. So those homes that are in the Garrett Hill neighborhood district would, I'm, I'm talking not the Garrett Hill Garrett Sorry. correct I'm talking strictly in that that overlay from the trolley tracks to Conestoga there are a few single family homes there they would not be able to feel the benefits of this um, of this ordinance because the Garrett Hill overlay would supersede um, would supersede any kind of benefits that they would get from from passing this I believe a portion from the trolley tracks to kind of Soga Road, and I'm looking at the zoning map, um, contains the Garrett Hill neighborhood district. Mm -hmm. um, so a portion of those homes would benefit. And yes, so I, there are. Uh, that, that, that's fine. But would a portion of those homes not be able to, a portion of the single family homes not be able to receive those benefits yeah there, there's uh, I'm looking about six properties uh, that that would apply to so, I know so some of those have rear access already uh, 131 133 they have the, the parking in the back uh, and then one a little bit further up on the same side of the road also has uh, a long driveway to the back so, so they would not be able to receive these correct okay so and some don't need it part, some don't need it yeah. but the ones that could use it would not correct oh, okay so to my point is that to make every to, to make those, you know, other neighborhoods have a benefit while a neighborhood that in the past is, is not having any benefits and having one less, um, you know, they, they have w w one less advantage. Um, so I, I appreciate it. I mean, I think it's great for most of the neighborhoods, but if it doesn't encompass all of them, then I just, it, it's an issue of equity and, and being fair, but thank you. Kevin, what, what could the downside to this ordinance change be? I'm not sure. Uh, and I'm sure opinions vary on that. Um, in most of the cases that we've seen, uh, other than one up on uh, Farriston, where it was a corner lot uh, in the R2 district um, that had a two-car garage and they wanted to convert one, um, people are utilizing their driveways for parking and not utilizing the garages because they were a single car garage uh, that they were not being utilized. So uh, I think in most cases, you're not going to see any visible difference. People are still going to park in their driveways. Um, I think the downside of not doing it, um, again, it starts, people want to do the projects, they're going to expand their driveways. Uh, and then I think many cases, you're going to have unchecked um, impervious coverage that, that won't be accounted for in a um, stormwater management plan. So, so we spent a lot of time on the uh, the townhouse development on Maplewood, and, and part of those discussions had to do with not being able to convert the the garage areas into living space. Would this affect or impact those discussions at all? No, I think um, they're deed restricted, if I recall correctly. That that was something that we wanted to ensure uh, because how tight that site was. Um, but in all of the situations that we've seen are in older neighborhoods on South Devon, Morningside Circle, Calvary Lane. Um, there were the older established developments that have single car garages uh, that weren't being utilized. And for the, for those specific areas, they couldn't just request a waiver. They would have to go through the zoning hearing board process. Um, that's a minimum of 30 days uh, at a site plan into that uh, to get a surveyor, uh, $550 application fee. So uh, if they choose to get an attorney, which we recommend uh, for the average homeowner that isn't used to going in front of the board, you're talking a couple thousand dollars in at least a month, if not two to three months by the time you get your site plan. All right, thank you. If you don't mind, I'm going to jump in one more time. John, um, since we have pending applications, I've never seen it done this way, but 
Do you think that we could use the pending ordinance doctrine to, if this were approved today, move forward with the applications that we have in hand? I know that's usually sort of a negative application rather than a positive one. Well, if it's introduced tonight, it's going to be advertised. Uh, so you'd have to make the assumption that it's going to be adopted. What if it's revised or changed? It's got to go to the Planning Commission. It's got to go to the county. I mean, it, can, it may come back. Uh, I don't think you can really use this to approve some pending application that's, that's sitting there. It's going to have to go through the process. Um, and then come back to the board after the two planning commissions review it, and then the board will have a public hearing and, and vote it in or not. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think there's a way to do that. Okay. I said I'd ask. It's a thought, but I, I've never seen it done that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't either. <laughs> you know, it's not on the books till it's on the books. So. It, it, you know. I know you can keep people at bay by uh, an ordinance that you introduce. Um, so I think right. you, you, but I've never seen it done the other way. So. Any other questions? I'm going to ask for a motion. So moved. And a second. Second. Um, public comment, please. Hi, Baron Gemmer, South Wayne Avenue. Um, I'd first like to say I have both sympathy and empathy for the folks that have spoken here. Um, seven years ago, I had to come here for a zoning hearing board to get relief on a setback that was about half the size of this table into one of the setbacks. Didn't have to do with parking, but that's the nature of, of that. The, I don't think enough has been talked about for the drawbacks of this. The, you know, we've, we've talked about a handful of folks here that have submitted applications, but there's, there's a couple areas where it's going to have a huge detrimental impact on the township. The first is redevelopment. Uh, Commissioner Abel mentioned Maplewood, and if they had been able to park in the front yard setback, not only maybe another lot would have been on there because of the way they could have arranged the parking in the driveway, as well as the overflow parking, which is there. And you're going to probably see you know, it could be average 10% or more uh, increased density on, on a lot of the redevelopment that takes place just because of this change alone. But, but that's not probably the biggest change here. The biggest change here is gonna be the aesthetics of the township. Um, Commissioner Mulroney talked about, well, you can't park on the grass as you pull in. But that 400 square feet that was just talked about, a lot of people might just put that right off their driveway and literally, if you're walking on the sidewalk, the cars are gonna be there and they don't have to go because of, the, because of that, and you're gonna see a lot more cars parked in front yards, which is exactly what we don't want. There's a, and, and it will be done. There's a house near me that does it right now illegally with just, with just Pebble. And you're gonna see it in rentals, but you're also gonna see it in uh, homes where there's a lot of kids and they, have, they need overflow parking, and that's gonna be a quick and easy way to put it. Even the recently, um, relatively recently um, passed WBOD you know, in commercial districts, we don't allow this because it, it, it looks bad. You have to at least have the setback all the way back for that. But if you're talking about these bucolic streets where you're walking down, whether it's mine, mine South Wayne or Aberdeen or some of the others, you're going to start seeing cars parked in front yards, particularly because it only takes 200 square feet to put a parking space in, and you can just put that right off your driveway. And it will happen. And so, so for the folks that need this because of their, their wanting to convert, that's what the zoning hearing board and that's what the variance is for. As, as I think as John just pointed out too, that's going to be a quicker process for those folks that want it. And it's not, necess it's not that onerous depending upon if you, if you have the need. But the impact of passing this or at least even moving along I think is, is just a huge impact aesthetically to this township and I know based upon shade trees and other things. Matter of fact, you might see more trees come down because now people right off their driveway might want to just put a couple spots on and if it's under six trees, they might be taking those down with, again, without requiring a permit for that. And I think that's all I have, thanks.
Good evening. Um, my name is Fran Forte. I'm a resident of Radnor Township, Ferriston Road. As Mr. Kachansky <clears throat> uh, cited our property as one that might be affected by the amendment to the ordinance. Um, on the contrary, though, my argument would be that right now I can't park in my driveway where I have 10 spots. Um, I'm not going to park on my grass. I'm simply going to park in my driveway legally. Um, and right now, I, I, I don't use my garage anyway for parking. I use it for my trash cans and other things. So this would now allow me legally to park in my driveway. I'm never going to park in my grass. I'm never going to do that to my neighbors. And um, I have, you know, I have two front setbacks in my in my home because I have a corner lot. So I know maybe my situation is not exactly the same as other situations around the township and, and the other districts that Mr. Kachansky cited, but I would argue that this, as Mr. Kachansky suggested, would incentivize those to use their driveway, not create another space next to their existing pavement for an additional parking zone or those that need to park on the grass. I'm in support of the amendment. Thank you. Hi, uh, Brian Kiefer, uh, 124 Calvary Lane. Um, I'm also in favor of the amendment, and uh, I, I think as well that you know it's it's kind of been uh, unfair where if you're a as as Kevin mentioned a front loaded home where the lots are narrow. If you're in a neighborhood that happens to have an older neighborhood with narrow lots. And you know, just the construction was such that, you know, the the garage is facing to the front. You're at a disadvantage in that you're currently not legally allowed to park in your own driveway, which doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Where, you know, a home that has a wider lot, you know, maybe you you are able to park on the side, um, and and they are they are allowed to have legal spots there. Um, for the sake of equity, you know, it makes sense to allow the front setback, whether it's partial, but in this case. I don't see why you just limit it that way. Just you know, call the in entire driveway as, as legal parking, and then therefore, you know, um, you're not enticed to try to somehow build a driveway around the side, of, you know, looping around the side of your home, adding all this impervious. Which, to me, it sounds like a big benefit to everybody. You know, the um, you know the resident, you know the the you know the the community to manage the stormwater. Uh, er everything I think is a, is an advantage and. I don't think people will change their parking habits, you know, to the concern of the one resident here. I, I think people will continue to park in their driveway, not on the grass. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mike Robinson again, 565 West Wayne. Uh, I find it kind of interesting that somebody who had to go through a process of applying for, uh, you know, relief under the zoning code would find it to not be a hardship. Um, you know, there's a significant price. There's a significant amount of planning and preparation. You have to show up to all the hearings. It's an imposition on the board taking its time for what? So someone can park in their driveway? Are we going to require all residents who are in violation of this ordinance? So it sounds like it's probably most residents to apply for zoning relief. I mean, that, that would just overload and the, uh, the, the system, and it's not really what that would be designed for. Not to mention that as the code, the code as it is, is 80 feet. I mean, 80 feet is, is a significant amount. We're talking about how, you know, 1,000 feet is a lot more than you give it credit for. 80 feet is a lot, too, especially on smaller lots. Um, you know, and again, I, I don't think this is going to be a rush of people to knock down all their trees and put 10 parking spots next to the sidewalk. That, that just seems a little impractical. And the fact that most people are in non-conforming existence already kind of exposes the, the flaws in the existing code here. I don't think this is a big change. As everyone else has said, well, most people are already parking in their driveways to begin with. Not to mention, look at all the, the current openings for remote work. How many longer are people going to have two cars? Um, I think that's going to change, too. So we're going to be talking about you know, an even more outdated portion of the code that's requiring two spaces for two cars and specific parking areas 80 feet back from the sidewalk. Um, so again, I think there's a lot of benefits here. I think they vastly outweigh any potential downside. Um, so I'm in favor of the ordinance. Is there any other public comment? Commissioners, any comment? I'll call the vote. 
All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Six to one with Farhi opposed. Thank you. I apologize, I lost my place. Here we go. Uh, resolution 2022-36, authorizing the expenditure of $155,421 from the township's PEG funding generated from the existing franchise agreements with Comcast and Verizon to replace the Radnor Shaw room technology equipment, including cameras, microphones, screens, monitors, wiring connections, and the necessary control equipment along with professional services to install, program, and train township staff. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. White to speak yep. to this. Yep. I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll lead us in. Hopefully the commissioners had an opportunity to take a look at the presentation that uh, Ian Myers put together for you. Um, I'll touch on some of the highlights. I think the title of the resolution encompasses the project, so pretty much everything that we use in this room uh, as it relates to the equipment would be replaced with uh, in kind. So the only difference being that we're replacing it with 2022 uh, equipment versus the 2008 equipment that's in here now. So the, the existing cameras would all be replaced as well as the projector screens, the monitors in front of our stations, the microphones, and then how all of those connect to the control room um, behind me uh, including getting a lot of it reorganized. Uh, if you had a chance to take a look at some of the pictures that Ian provided in the presentation, um, you could see that um, the, the wiring situation is uh, very 2008-ish, uh, just a, a jumbled mess, a rat's nest of, of wires. Um, so uh, that's, that's what we had purchased. The, the actual physical equipment is all off of state contract pricing. Um, and then on top of that, we would be paying Laro to install, program, and then train the staff. Uh, the source of the money, the PEG funds, uh, if, if you'll recall, these are generated from our franchise agreements with Comcast and Verizon. Um, we included this on uh, the page four of the, the presentation where the township, had, at the end, after we distribute most of the money to Radnor Studio 21, um, to pay for their responsibilities under the public access portion of the PEG. Uh, we are responsible for the government portion of the PEG, the G in PEG, uh, and we retain roughly 30,000-ish per year. That number jumped up to almost 50,000 last year once we realized um, the additional scope of the, the source from Comcast with the new franchise agreement. That, there, if you looked at their line item, you could see it jumped uh, quite a bit as a result of the new franchise agreement. So uh, these funds are set aside in our capital fund every year. They have to be used for the equipment uh, associated with our obligation or our uh, requirement under these agreements to broadcast these meetings. Um, so we are, and I, I should also mention this is something that we've been looking at for a couple of years. Uh, things got paused a bit with uh, personnel changeover and and then COVID uh, helped put the brakes on this a little bit. Um, but we're excited to bring this back to the board, use these funds, um, and get this equipment replaced. Um, as, if approved tonight, uh, the lead time would uh, be August, which we um, selected deliberately, uh, since that's the month a, a lot of our boards and commissions are in recess. Uh, to the extent we need a meeting or a meeting is scheduled and, and it occurs as scheduled, those can go via Zoom, um, as this room will be largely shut down for that month while uh, all, the, all the things are replaced, mostly by our feet <laughs> is where a lot of the dirty work will take place, and then ultimately back behind this wall. So um, that's what's in front of you tonight. Um, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to do the best I can. If they're real technical, Ian's happy to come out uh, from the control room and help us out. Um, but that's what we have tonight. Thank you, Mr. White. Um, Maggie, do you have a comment? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, is there any way to attempt to sell 
probably can't, but at least donate maybe to a school or something the current equipment um, so it's not just thrown away or recycled? No, I think that's an excellent idea, something that we'll look at. I'm not sure the schools, uh, I, I don't know their technology. It, I, I it may imagine. not be our school, but it might yeah. be somebody's school. Absolutely. No, I think that's a really good idea because uh, some of it still works. Um, albeit on borrowed time, but it, it is still functioning, obviously. We're on TV tonight, so. Any I'll other commissioners? Yeah, I'll say if, if Ian did this and Ian approves, uh, Ian is like our public works. He is our unsung hero. I mean, people barely know that he's there, and he does a great job. Um, so, Ian, thank you for putting this together, and if uh, it has your blessings, then, uh, then it has mine, so thanks. I have a question. Um, what happens to PEG funding if it's unused? Well, I'm not sure I know the answer to that because it, it, it really needs to be used. I mean, the amount that we're generating or we're netting every year, um, when you look at a price tag like this for this equipment, uh, it'll always be used. It may be a number of years again before we're in this position. Hopefully that's the case. Um, hopefully we get a similar life um, out of the replacement equipment. But what we'll be doing next year and the years after that is reaccumulating funds for the eventual replacement of what we're buying this year. So it's not mandatory that it must be spent every year? No, no, it's just mandatory that it's spent for equipment, um, equipment specifically geared towards our responsibility to broadcast, to record and broadcast these meetings. Thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? I will ask for a motion to approve. So moved. And a second? Second. Thank you. Is there public comment? I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimously passed. Thank you. Um, moving on to, I believe this is the last um, item on the agenda, item I, a motion to draft a letter to state representatives and the governor to create a complete freeze or graduated reduction in the PA gas tax until this crisis, I believe that's a typo, is resolved. Um, and Commissioner Farhi, I believe this is yours. Um, thanks. Um, do I need a second to bring this or just? If you just lead us, well, we can, okay. do I have All a right. motion? Well, we can do it that way. Okay. If I have a motion. That's me. And a second. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, and I'll be brief, it's getting late. Uh, thank you, Maggie. Um, so it's kind of a two-part ask. Uh, the first thing is, um, and I spoke to Bill about it and with uh, staff, what this township would do if we do have rising commodity prices to the point where um, they get you know, somewhat out of control. Um, we may be able to handle $4.50 gasoline, but what happens if it goes up to $10? How does that affect our services, the services that we've uh, come to love and expect, how does it affect our police, our trash, um, other commodity prices as well. And I'm not asking for answers, I just want to be proactive about this. I know that um, in the past, so take our emergency management team, our Office of Emergency Management. They did a great job with COVID. It was an emergency, they never knew anything about it. And I'm not saying that we need that, a team for it, but how do we handle worst case scenarios? And that's kind of what I'm looking for moving forward um, because we are coming out of COVID. We do have an international crisis. There's a lot yeah. of, uh, there are always factors no. that explain. I'm, I'm sorry, do you, do, Commissioner Borowski. No, I was just gonna um, point of order on this a little, yeah. um, Sean, is that this is a motion to draft a letter yeah. to state representatives and yes. the governor. Yes, yeah. so there's, like I said, it's a two part ask. I just wanna kind of lead in with the, the Okay, situation. but the other ask isn't in here, so oh, you okay. might have well, to amend. Fine. Um, okay, well then I'll just talk about the, uh, the gas tax. Um, so as you know, Pennsylvania, or you may not know, has the highest state gasoline tax in the country at about 58 cents a gallon. On top of that, there's another 18 cents federally. Um, any increase acts as a recessive tax, meaning that uh, it takes more, uh, a greater percentage of income from um, people like our school bus drivers, teachers, and our public works employees. If you're Bill Gates and gas goes from $4 to $10, it's not gonna affect how you drive and how you live, but for our essential workers that 
may live or work in the township, it's definitely going to have a, it's definitely a hardship on them. Um, the good thing about, the only good silver lining about rising commodity prices is that they typically work their way out. Typically, there's a uh, reversion to the mean, and prices will come down. Unfortunately, uh, when you look at situations uh, either that's going on, um, as John Maynard Keene said, he's a noted uh, economist, he said, um, markets can stay rational much longer than you can stay solvent. So when you look at the price of rising gasoline, typically they spike up, and it takes a long time for it to uh, gradually go back down. Um, so basically, um, I think that the, the increase in prices is really, really hurting um, some of our uh, financially fragile people, our most vulnerable people who may have to decide, I can't fill up my tank of gas, I have uh, you know, medicine I have to buy, I have food I have to buy, and I think this would really hurt, uh, really help, pardon me, some of them who are, uh, who are feeling this pinch. Um, now, I know that's not to say that it doesn't have its drawbacks. There's a liquid fuel tax. Um, you know, this may get, and, but it also has advantages too, like it'll get people um, looking at more maybe hybrid cars and whatnot as well. So um, that's basically what I have, and I think that, um, uh, like I said, the, the, it's, you're looking at close to what, 76 cents a, a gallon in taxes, and that has a, uh, that has a big impact on, uh, on our residents. So uh, I would ask the board to uh, consider petitioning our state reps and governor um, uh, by drafting a letter to tempor temporarily suspending or suspending partially or graduating uh, putting a, uh, a graduation on the the um, uh, gas tax, the state gas tax. Thanks. So I'm gonna. Uh, I would like to jump in with just a different perspective um, on that. One is that um, this your request to send something to the governor may be moot. If um, there's a press release announced, I guess over the weekend that announcing that Governor Wolf commits to phasing out gas tax and has announced a commission to develop funding solutions. Okay, in so the meantime. Just okay. pulled that up today. Sure, thank you, great. Mm -hmm. um, so that point may be moot, um, recognizing the um, infrastructure funding that the gas tax supports. Sure. The governor is, um, is starting a commission now um, to be able to find alternative uh, revenue sources if you were to phase out a gas tax. So that brings me to my second point. Um, we've committed um, as a township to uh, repave every year up to about a million dollars in our uh, road resurfacing program. Um, that would allow the township to get through full paving in about 12 to 14 years, which is the estimated lifespan of a newly surfaced road. And I just asked for um, some numbers to try to understand this issue. Sure. And um, we receive from the gas tax, from the liquid fuels, um, 825, give or take. 2020 was 885,000. Um, 2021 was 827,000. Um, so that is a big chunk of our commitment as a township to support the repaving project and improve our infrastructure. And um, the roads resurfaced in 2021 is almost 30 roads, um, equaling 7.8 miles of paving. Mm -hmm. So I just, I hesitate to support sure. this, not because I think it's a bad idea to um, help um, our you know, members of our township who are facing, um, all of us facing these rising gas prices. Um, but one, because I think the governor is already acting on it. So, um, you know, I don't think he needs to hear from us to do that. Sounds like it's a well laid plan. And second of all, we rely on this money um, from gas tax to be able to pave our roads and um, keep our township um, safe. Sure. So for that reason, I'm not going to um, support it, but I open it up for comments from others. And if you'd like to respond, Can I respond course. to that or of do you course. want to wait? Till, uh, sorry, or and, and let me you. just respond real quick and then, respond. okay. So I, I get that. Uh, the, the resurfacing, if 
you won't get some of that liquid fuel tax. The advantage again is if there's less driving, there's going to be less wear and tear on the road. The 800,000 that we do get, uh, it doesn't help someone that's struggling to pay for medicine or struggling to put food on the, the table for their family. Um, and regarding to what you said about the governor being involved, I believe he is looking, and, and I didn't see today, um, it's 18 cents. He wants to get, he's uh, petitioning Congress to get rid of the 18 cent federal tax. Um, but as you know, these things can take a long time, okay? If this takes a year and you have a struggling family who, again, uh, do I pay my mortgage? Do, you know, uh, do I put groceries on the table? Uh, you know, and, or do I, you know, pay for uh, my, you know, medication? That's really what I am looking at. I understand it. It's, it there's going to be pain fed all over. There's going to be sacrifice all over. I am definitely one that I'm not happy to do it, but, uh, you know, I'm there. I get it. Uh, I'm just looking for our, looking out for our most fra financially uh, fragile residents that really, really, um, that are, you know, some of them are essential workers or school bus drivers, um, you know, public works and nurses, and that, you know, they're going to be struggling getting to back and forth to work. So, but thank you. Any other commissioners have questions? Well, I, I don't think, I think to Commissioner Mulroney's point, I don't think um, it's one group that's struggling. We all feel the impact because we all fill up at the pump at some point. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I tend to, well, I tend not to support non-binding resolutions, um, but, but I, I think I could go, I think I could find myself supporting a letter to the governor requesting a gas tax holiday, but the way it's written in this agenda, it's open-ended. I, I don't know what the crisis is, and I don't have an end date. So what are you proposing? Putting an end date? Well, when I think of a gas tax holiday, I'm, you know, my, you know when, I, when I read that, I was thinking, um, you know, we're coming out of COVID. Um, you know, families are feeling a pinch. You got high inflation. You have high gas prices, um, and, and you want to give them, you know, some extra money to be able to, to, to go on, you know, and, and this is the time of season where everybody's driving, you know, they're going to the shore, they're taking family yeah, vacations. Um, so I would think if you're going to put some parameters, you know, a gas tax holiday through Labor Day weekend, you know, that's something that's, that I might be able to, fine. I might be able to support. Okay. Yeah. Then, then that could be added into a letter if it, if, if it passes. Mm -hmm. But, that, but then uh, we also have to, I mean, what, what's the crisis we're trying well, to? Well, I mean, uh, you have a, a, a war going on where we're restricting uh, imports in oil. So until that situation gets balanced, and as I said, fuel prices, uh, gasoline, and commodity, and this is a general conversation, uh, you know, commodity prices rise, and especially at the pump, and oil can go from 100 to 120 overnight, and gas prices go from 350 to 450 overnight, but we're not going to see it going back down to 350 for weeks or months or whatever. And when you do have, uh, you know, uncertainty, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's inflation, you know, international or abroad or whatever, you're definitely going to see elevating. The markets don't like uncertainty and, and until there's a more certain environment. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so maybe the word uh, crisis shouldn't have worked, but that's really some of what precipitated this, but coming out of COVID too, and and uh, you know summer, you know summer summer driving is great, but for me, like I said, I'm worried about our, our most financially fragile people that are going to have decisions to make when it comes to medication, you know, rent, mortgages, or, or, or food. Any other um, commissioner? So just well, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry, Lisa. Go ahead, Maggie. Uh, just a, a quick comment. I mean, Pennsylvania was very solvent last year um, and actually had, uh, as Radnor Township, um, an excess in funds. Um, they did get a huge allotment from um, the president's bills for infrastructure. I mean, it, uh, I'm with Jake. I think it needs to, would need to be a defined period of time. Um, but it might really help people that need to drive to get to work, to to eat and and but I would I would frame it uh, I'll you know if, however you guys want to frame it I'm I'm comfortable I like I said my issue isn't what's said it's what's done and it's helping those people that need the biggest break right now 
So I, I guess it brings up another question for me, which is, uh, you know, we don't control the gas tax. It's federal and state controlled um, what, what those taxes are. There are lots of taxes we do control, and I'm not hearing you ask for us to provide any relief from something that we ask people to pay for, as opposed to sending a letter to um, ask state and federal action. So it just, it's too attenuated for me, and I don't think that, um, I don't think it, it directly addresses the issue that you're trying to, by t your, you know, to take care of the community, and I hear you that that's your intention is to um, take care of the community, so. Okay, I mean, if I said let's lower property taxes 15%, I think You're probably not there'd, getting be an, uh, there'd be an underwhelming <laughs> or an overwhelming I think you're not foul. getting that But vote. yeah, no, yeah. I mean, uh, but yeah, like I said, this is not without its problems. You know, it's not perfect. I'm, like I said, I'm just looking out for the average, the average Joe like me uh, who's just, you know, trying to scrape by. That's all. So I agree. I, when I first read it, I didn't feel like this had a lot of teeth. I thought we would just explore. You know, you said you wanted to just talk about it, but I think, you know, what gives it teeth is making it a more nuanced approach. And I agree if we, you know, do something that's more finite in terms of time, like a tax holiday around Labor Day or something like that, then there's some merit there. So I just that's my two cents. Bill, I mean, you're if you, this passes, which I don't know if it will. I mean, you're getting all this to maybe craft something or. Or do you have an opinion on this? Uh, well, I think John Rice will do an excellent job drafting it. <clears throat> but is that, I think, is that, is that I think, a no that you can't do I think do we're all John comparing or? notes. John, and before do, we move to staff, oh, I think okay. we've sorry. got another I'm commissioner sorry. coming. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sure. Pardon. So yeah, I'm just, um, you know, like I don't think it's a bad idea, but I'm just, so to Commissioner Mulroney's point about what uh, the governor's proposed, uh, if you read, um, so uh, the um, leadership of the House uh, or the, the Senate, uh, Senator Corman has also already proposed something uh, around a tax, uh, gas tax holiday. And uh, there's, uh, so there's things out there that says suspend the tax for six months. Uh, there's one that says reduce the tax by one third for the rest of the year. So there's a lot of things already, I think, floating around within the legislature and they are um, you know, looking at that, you know, and then trying to also figure out ways how you offset that cost. I mean, you can't just cut it and then say, you know, we don't have, and there's, I guess, it seems like, you know, using some of the COVID funding, which would be great because there's a lot of COVID funding money still sitting in the state um, that needs to be allocated. And, um, you know, maybe some other things, but it, it seems like there's, things out there already. Um, and maybe one of the best ways to, to support is to reach out to the representatives that are already kind of leading this charge. Um, you know, I guess I, I'm not sure, uh, you know, just to say yes, do that, you know, what is yes, do that, and then do what else? And I guess I am a little concerned that um, you know the impact on the township because we do get we do get funding from that and I'd like to know what that's going to look like is one of the things they're going to cut is the funding to the townships for the for the liquid fuel um, tax and I and I hear what you're saying Commissioner Farhi around trying to help people I guess you know I would like to see if there's something we could do ourselves um, to maybe help people given you know, what we have um, experienced, you know, our, ourselves, you know, certainly being in a much better financial position than we were. Um, is there something that, you know, we could really do that would really make a difference? And then the other thing, and I feel like I heard this from several of the commissioners, you know, some of this is about, you know, people making choices. So maybe, um, and I don't mean you know, choosing between medication or anything like that. That's certainly not, you know, I, that, that is not what I'm uh, suggesting. But, you know, maybe we are going to see a trend of people choosing smaller cars or, you know, being a little more energy conscious, um, you know, than they have been when uh, gas is a little more accessible. So I guess I'd like to, you know, I don't oppose this. Um, I feel like there's a lot already floating around out there, so it 
you know, I feel like in some ways people have it covered, um, but I guess I, I would join so, so let me, let me see. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. You know, I guess I would like to see what, you know, you, I think you raise an excellent point, so what could we do? Sure, so, but to your point is what's being put out there may or may not pass. So letting the governor know or letting our state representatives know uh, our feeling, whether it's a feeling from the board or if it fails uh, individually, I think that's important. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, it's not going to be a total reduction, uh, probably, of the gas tax. We know that. Um, it's, it's not, it's not perfect. Um, but you know, if you want to petition Harrisburg about kratom, this is something too. Um, you know, these are you know uh, health and safety concerns. Whether or not you can, um, you know, get to work and 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 pay, and pay for you know a place to live. Pay, you know, pay for heat. So uh, yeah, it's whatever this board decides. But my 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 uh, position is nothing is guaranteed from the governor, from the house, or from the state house or the state senate. And I again want to be proactive on this. I don't want to be reactive, um, as uh, it's been done in the past. I don't want to be reactive. I want to bring this up, and I want to see um, if if you know, and let them know what's going on. I don't know. It's, it's for me. I feel that it's common sense. I, I understand the pushback. I understand that you're not comfortable with it. Um, I think that we're super lucky. I am super lucky. You know. I mean, I have a, a you know a, a beat up pickup truck that I'm lucky to get six miles a gallon. Uh, it's nothing to brag about. But at the same time, I can still afford to fill that gas tank up. Um, but I just look around me to the people that are that are that are truly um, struggling. Now I need that for work. Um, and, you know, people are going to need to drive for work. I mean, life is going to have to go on. So, again, uh, I'll, I'll um, uh, you know, I'll leave it to this board to decide what they want to do. But, you know, those are my, those, those are my feelings. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, is there any other Commissioner comment? Staff, any comment? Didn't hear from you yet. Well, yeah, I mean, you just. started to answer a question I'd like to allow. No, that's okay. I just. Um, you know, depending on what the board ultimately decides, I, 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 I've heard a couple commissioners mention uh, being in favor of a better defined parameter or letter. We just didn't really define what that is. So I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not sure how the vote's going to go, but if it's if it's supportive within a certain parameter or a specific date, um, I, I, we still need to nail that down. Um, other than that, I mean, I've got all sorts of thoughts and opinions on everything else discussed, but I'll, I'll save those. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll just write the letter. Bill, if you're against it, then, and you don't think it's a good idea, then, then let us know. I mean. No, I, so, I mean, I'll speak very uh, directly on the liquid fuels portion of this. So if, if we write the letter and enough communities around the state put pressure on the governor to the point where he makes that decision and the gas tax is reduced or um, eliminated in any way and that affects our liquid fuels tax. So instead of putting a million dollars in the roads per year, we're going to put whatever that new number is. So all it's going to do is lengthen our program out. Um, and the long term effect of that will be, you know, not as well, there'll be worse roads and uh, for us. Th that's the, that's kind of the nice thing about this program is it is self-funded for the most part. I mean, we put a little bit in per year to get us to that million. Um, but the fact that we're generating 825, it, it, it peaked a few years ago at over 900,000, which was nice. Um, but it, it's, it's self-contained. If, if the board, if we lose that liquid fuels money and we want to supplement it with a new dollars from the township, um, then now we're raising taxes to fund something that used to be paid for through gas tax, and I'm not sure that's a solution that we're really looking for here. Um, so I, it seems like if we want to stay true to what's being proposed, and that's a lower end-of-the-day cost for the Radnor resident, then uh, a reduction in gas tax is going to result in uh, a reduction in our ability to resurface roads. Uh, and again, that there's a lot of, there's like, a thousand steps that happen after the letter that need to happen, but um, you know, in terms of operating the township, 
Um, the, the gas tax is, is one thing we pay at a state level that we get an immediate return on. We get it back. You know, we, we put the gas in our cars and we get some of that back from the state to help us out on our roads. So uh, we pay a lot of different taxes to the state and federal government. Most of those we don't ever see again. This, in, this is one in particular that we do get to see again. So there is a, a return on uh, that investment. So I, um, I, I'm not trying to understate the impact. I mean, we, as has been pointed out, we're all paying it. Um, I'm just not sure that, uh, you know, it, it, again, it's just going to depend on what we want to do with our roads. And Thank you. Um, I'm going to call for public comment. Seeing none, I will call the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Aye. Fails to carry. Um, moving on to report of board liaisons. Does anybody want to report on a um, board meeting over the past couple of weeks? So Tammy, uh, from now on, will give me a great list of fun things going on in the township. Excellent. Um, so on Friday, April 1st, we're going to have the second annual flashlight egg hunt that is at the Wayne Art Center. That is for teenagers. Uh, on the 30th, we're going to have uh, Arbor Celebration Day, which will be 4.30 at Odoricio Park. Um, and also, if uh, you have small kids or teenagers or maybe college kids, I don't know the age. Um, there are some summer camps uh, that the township has, so please go to the Radnor Township page and you can get information about them. And if you have a, uh, a child, uh, a teenager, or maybe someone a little bit older that can, uh, wants to be a camp counselor, uh, we could do that as well. And finally, um, Good news for those uh, wanting to know about the Fenimore Woods Rehab Project, that the feasibility study is underway, and Tammy will have uh, a, um, a roundtable meeting, the third roundtable meeting, uh, once we get the report finalized. And Maggie Myers, I am sure you will be out there. Yes. Um, so yeah. And one quick thing, thank you, Tammy Cohen. I know you're short staff and you get it all done. So from me and the rest of the board of uh, the committee, the Parks and Rec Committee, thank you for your tireless work. Uh, everybody in the township appreciates it. Thanks. Hey, hey Sean, can you just double check the Arbor Day? Arbor Day, I, I thought it was April I 20, see April Friday, April 29th okay. at 4.30. I thought you said uh, April 30th. At 4.30, yeah. but we can double check that. No, no, that's the correct date. Okay, yep, did thanks. I say the wrong day? Yeah, I, th I thought I heard April 30th. Pardon? I thought I heard April 30th, but it's April Oh, it's April the 30th 29th. year. I am so sorry. Yep. April 29th. All right. Sorry. Any other reports? I'll move on to new business. Is there any old business? Yeah, one, one item in old business. Um, I had a couple neighbors reach out and inquire about um, electronic recycling, um, you know, spring cleaning. They're getting rid of uh, old clothes, too, that can't be donated to other, other um, organizations. So, Bill, is there any, I, I, we had a, in the past, we had a relationship with Retriever. Um, I think that expired for reasons I'm not aware of. Is that, is there uh, the ability to, to um, uh, you know, repartner with with retriever or a similar organization yeah i um what what we did is back in 2020 or tw late 2019 we entered into a 12-month pilot program with at the time it was curb my clutter uh they were during the during that 12-month term they were bought out by retriever um and that 12-month uh pilot period just lapsed um I, I can only going back through our our emails we can only come to the conclusion that it just it just fell off and wasn't addressed for renewal. Um, we have reached out to Retriever. Uh, we did get the statistics that I can share with the board on the 12 months, the, the number of folks that took advantage of it, the, the pounds of clothes and electronics that were processed through that program. Um, it was not insignificant, um, so I think it's worth revisiting. Uh, there is a fee associated with it. Um, 
that the resident pays directly to Retriever for that service, but it was something that was being utilized during the 12 month pilot period. So, um, you know, it's, it seems to have some value and, and we have, we actually set up a meeting with the, um, the company to, to take a look at a, a more permanent contract and I can bring that to the board. Um, in the meantime, though, we'll share, uh, reshare, I, well, share with the newer commissioners, but reshare with everyone what those statistics were back with Retriever, just so everyone refreshes on um, the amount of service they did provide. Bill, is, oh, I was just going to say, isn't Representative O'Mara having a, um, did you, would that all work out? Yes. Did she have electronics and paper shredding and something coming up? Yes. Um, I'd, I'd have to ask Peggy to help me out with the date on that. But if we did work it out, it's going to be at the Radnor Financial Center. It is a shred event. They are allowing um, laptops and hard drives, I believe, as the electronics. And I think the DA is doing a prescription drug collection as part of it. Um, it's something that we're cross-promoting, so it should be out on our sites um, with the date. Uh, but we were able to locate, uh, re redo the location. Um, just. And for full disclosure, it was supposed to be here, but we did an electronic uh, recycling event a few years ago, and it snarled up traffic in this area for hours, um, which made it difficult not only for police to operate, but the, the neighbors. So uh, Radnor Financial was nice enough to step up and help us out uh, while they've got the space. And Bill, can you remind me um, what time of year we typically host um, the recycling event? Is that October? Yeah, so the one that the township offers is usually in the fall, okay. October. Um, and Peggy's quick on the draw. This so is May 21st. May 21st, yeah. 9 to noon. May 21st. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Going back to um, new business, um, so would we then put, um, do we have to do anything to do what um, Jake su suggested with the uh, petition? Is that something that we would bring up a new business or how do we do that for Kratom and Delta 8? Oh, Jack's suggestion about um, leading the petition? Yeah. Um, do you want to discuss it in new business? Do you want to work on it and bring it forward um, to another meeting? Um, yeah, I can just add it to the agenda at the next meeting. Is that okay? Me. That we'll just add it to the next agenda? Because we don't have a physical petition now, so we'd just be talking about talking about it. Okay, fair enough. Um, just, public uh, participation. Any, sorry, any petition, have Kratom one petition, have Delta 8, no, have them, have them two separate. Oh, oh. No, have them two separate. They're two separate items, so I would ask that they're that not, makes on the same, not on the same form. Um, is there any other new or old business from commissioners? Is there any public participation? Sarah Pilling, 29 Garrett Avenue. I'm a member of the EAC. I received notice today that there will be a public hearing for the plastic bag ban on the 24th. March, is it March or April? Bill, do you have Bill, the date for the, the, date is it the, for the e public hearing for the plastic bag? Is that April or is it March? I think it's March. Is it the EAC meeting? Is it March 24th? It's, yeah. And it's during the EAC meeting. So it will be advertised, but I just want you to know that it is happening. Okay, can I get a motion to adjourn? Second. Yes. All in favor? Thank you.